Bricks and Minifigs is your one-stop shop for all things LEGO. Hit the link below to find a store near you. Hey everyone, Joshua Hanlon here at Nebraska Brick Days, and today we've got a massive pirate layout for you, and I've got the three builders here that are going to take us through it, so you want to introduce yourselves? I'm Steven Romsberg. I'm Jeremy Smith. Michael Orphan. Hey, thank you so much, and I love this layout. We're going to start with this island right here, so if you want to tell us a little bit about what you do on this island, then we'll make our way around. All right. Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it, it's a treasure island, it, and uh, we've placed a lot of different um, Easter eggs, kind of popular cultural references in there for the kids and, and for the classic fan as well. So the, you'll see the typical Islander type set up there. And then, but, but then there's Scrooge McDuck, there's um, <laughs> Doctor Who over there, uh, Metal Beards on the side, and some of the Disney princesses on, uh, on the other uh, coast over there. But uh, we, try to, we try to stay, uh, make it, uh, try to put some realism in there, but also keep it to that kind of play level that kids usually might uh, associate with. So that's what we tried to do. And, and you'll see some, uh, the, you know, the brick, uh, brick um, uh, treasure house, so, so to speak, and a cave that uh, the, it's kind of like a temple. Or, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure where we're going with that, but, <laughs> but it's somewhere in between. So, and then some of the huts we tried to, because uh, Islanders is a weird theme because is it Caribbean or is it Polynesian? We don't know because pirates should be in the Caribbean. But anyway, I tried to lean it towards the Polynesian theme, and uh, I think it came out real well. I mean, uh, and then the main thing is we tried, we all collaborated together to make the, uh, you know, we tried to make the similar islands, shapes, and, and sizes. And, uh, and, and it, it, you know, so that's why we had to actually rebuild the, all this so we all match together. And, but it, it's a labor of love. We, we, we love to collaborate and do stuff like this. So. Yeah. One thing I noticed, you also have lights in some of the different sections here as well, right? Yeah, yes. we just started adding yeah. lights. So the last two weeks or so, we, we got some light kits that we've had for a while and, and then some custom LED stuff so we can make some effects. So yeah. hopefully by, uh, by Lincoln in the fall, uh, we'll have everything lit up on the on the whole table. So. And, and probably add sound to it yeah. as well. Yeah, so. we do have sound, sound bite stuff. We just didn't have time to get it in there. Yeah. <laughs> That's exciting, though, adding more in the future. So let's kind of walk around the corner over there, and then we'll get to, get to the other island uh, as we go around. So uh, the newest build stuff that we've put on the table, obviously the volcano is uh, it's about a five- or six-day build. Kind of just last minute we decided to put one on. Uh, it's been a really big hit. Everybody says they love the way it looks, so that's cool. Uh, I, I took my hand at building a Kraken, and everybody builds them with the mouth open now ever since they've seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. So I wanted something a little different. This one's just coming up from the bottom and grabbing a, a small ship. So I really like it, and it's been a really big hit too. Um, the corner stuff, I'm, a, I'm an old guy, so I've had – pirate stuff since I was a kid. So we have a little bit of mock and a little bit of classic vintage sets, and we kind of put them together to make a cove. Um, I like showing, I know most people like a ton of mocks, but I like putting a, f a lot of classic sets in too because of the older generation that remember I didn't have enough money to buy that, but I loved it. So we put those on, and, and uh, it's been a big hit. Like I said, our, our goal is to have everything mocked by the end of the year. Um, we just finally got base plates. We used to have just... Uh, uh, blue sheets and then put everything on but we got our base plates our volcano lighting this was our goal for this season so we've done pretty good getting where we're at and I love some of the details over here if we can show this John oh, uh, so you've got pirate the pirate cove we call it snake island and it's kind of where all the pirates bring their treasure and stick it in the back so it's really hard to display because I want people to see inside but I want it realistic so it's really hey it's a mountain on one side but it's it's actually full of treasure so and then how about that giant pirate ship we have okay. right here? So this is my, when I started back into Lego, I had a dark age where I kind of got out of it. So about 2014, 15, I got back in and uh, the Brick Bounty and a couple of the other ships, you know, came out. And I basically just took a couple sets and collectively built a mock out of them. Um, it's really gaudy. It's got really stacked cabins and everything. But uh, the tradition of play style, it's more like what a kid likes. So, and I love that style. I think it looks fun. So it's fully stocked, it's got full interior, and like I said, all the ships that are on the table, all the custom ships are all full interior ships. So uh, we don't get to show the inside very often, but like I said, I like it. The goal is to do custom sales, which uh, I print a few. I print these um, kind of just to reproduce some of the stuff that Lego's already done. So, but that's the, the good thing about the pirate line is all the guys that build, they like custom sales. So we're, we're trying to get there, so. 
we're still young. Our, our lug is only about two years old now. So, you know, we're kind of fresh at it. We're kind of new guys on the block. So we love it. That's okay. You know, everybody starts somewhere, and this is a great start. Before we go any further with the other ships, let's take a look at the island over there. Uh, my pirate island, I basically I bought the three-in-one pirate ship. I mocked it, and then I was like, I need a pirate island. So <laughs> I built the basic pirate island with treasure hunting, where they dig up the treasure, and then a hangman's cove with the dead pirates and just hanging out. And uh, Man, what else? I got... Uh, <laughs> What I like is the, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> the, uh, the guy hanging out with the, the shells over there, the crabs, and then my, um, oh, I can't think of her name now. I had her name. Uh, the mermaid over there yeah. on the corner? Yeah. <laughs> and, I got, uh, and then I got the uh, shipwreck, had to have a classic shipwreck on the rocks. And then I found Sloth, and he was just have fun for pirates. There you go. So lots of fun kind of references in there, some great scenes as well. Exactly. There's a uh, cave on the other side. It's hard to see. So it leads to, like, dinosaur land. It has two dinosaurs on the end. And so. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Good work. Yeah, thank so, you. so then we'll keep moving to the some more of the, the pirate ships here. So uh, the last part of it is basically the Red Coat Fort which uh, my son, he's not here right now, but he helped build a lot of it. So he was really proud of how we put it back together. Um, and then obviously since we had a big port, we had to do a man of war ship. So he helped me kind of mock the ship on the other side of the table there, the big long ship. So, but we've had a really good time with it. All the little islands, like I said, back to classic sets. And then we did a lot of mock islands around them. So a little collaborative of everything, Pirates of the Caribbean, some of the old Pirate Line stuff from 2015, 2019, so, but. Let's take a closer look at some of the details on the, the fort over here. So you've got lots of great soldiers. What are, what all is happening here? Okay, so traditionally they would have like a prison fort. Um, this isn't, you know, basically a fort for a lot of nice people. This is kind of rugged fort. So the inside is a prison and the Pirates have kind of did a prison break on the inside and are held in hold all the people hostage. Um, all the troops on the outside and the, uh, the judge who's passing sentence on them, and there's actually a hang hangman's noose, but they're actually so busy, they're not seeing that the pirates are breaking out from the inside. So uh, this was just kind of a fun build, and it's kind of taken on its own little shape here and there. But the port is a collective of sets that we just kind of mocked them, kind of rearranged them the way we wanted them because they made them to where you could snap them together in any different direction. So we made the small port and then just added the ships around it. Uh, the pirate battle, we like the classic ships. Um, it's got what they said, play action. It's one of the very few ships from the old lines that actually had it. So we like it because the mask can lay down and you can make it look like it's actually being attacked and sunk. So I had a really good time with it. It's a good time. <laughs> And I love, I think, is that the Pirate Bay idea yes. set in the middle there? And what, what's so great about that is that set's so fantastic. It just fits in flawlessly and with the rest the of this. We really left it all original. The only thing we did was we added uh, waves to the shoreline around the outside to give it a little bit of better better placement on the table. But other than that, we added a few minifigs. But it's such a good-looking set. Um, I opted not to put the sails on it. I just I, I have a problem rolling them up, so I don't want to. Didn't want to roll them up, but I really love the set. It goes really well between the new and the old sets. So uh, eventually we've got enough parts now. We're going to actually add on to it and make it a little bit bigger whenever we get to the next show. So, But, yeah, we had a really good time. I put it on there. A lot of people haven't seen it displayed. They see pictures of it. So I like to put it on the table just so people can see what it looks like built. So how do you guys plan for the collaborative layout like this then in terms of space and who's bringing what? Well, how we got the width and the length of the table is basically this is as big as I can build in the basement. And this is sets up all the time. We, when we get home, we set it all up just the same way. So we can actually physically move and adjust things. And we don't have to tear it back down until we go take it to a show. So the islands just kind of took on their own form. Uh, Steven started his first, and we kind of followed suit when we built the other islands. And we're kind of evolving. Like I said, building mock islands is still kind of new to us. So we're uh, we're learning some new techniques as we go and like I said for the future I think that's what we want to do we want to change all the sets out to actual mock sets and uh, get rid of this the the standard set stuff so but like I said it's it's kind of an ever-evolving thing the good thing about doing it on plates and uh, each island is done basically uh, in mills 
uh, kind of a mill setup to where you can separate the islands into pieces. So whenever we get done, we'll shift it around, and each time we can kind of move the islands where we want. So That's great. Well, I'm excited to see you guys continue to work yeah. on this in the future. Thank you for all the work you did no bringing problem. this to the show. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Hey, everyone. Joshua Hamlin here at Brick Fair Virginia 2022, and today I'm joined by several builders who have worked on this massive LEGO Pirates collaborative layout here at Brick Fair. So I've got the first builder with me here. If you want to introduce yourself and kind of give an overview of what this is. Hi, uh, this is Kat. I worked with some of my LUG members, we're all members of Charm City LUG, to create this uh, nice pirate cove here. We have been calling it Charm City Cove. And the mastermind behind this was Jason, and you'll get a chance to talk to him in a bit. Basically, he worked and just designed this nice grid and a map, and he oversaw it and tried to keep us all in check. And we worked together for probably the last two to three years on it periodically, going, hanging out, you know, building, landscaping, all that fun stuff. And then, of course, there was a big 11th hour push this week to finish it up. So, Because, of course, like planning and working ahead is a struggle for LEGO fans. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, people ask when it's going to be done, and I say it's going to be done when the doors open to the public. <laughs> Wherever we're at at that point is the finished product. So we'll launch on in with this section here. So I think you kind of worked on this city. What, what's happening here? Yeah, so... Um, I made this lighthouse uh, that matches the fort that we've got and then a city gate here. We obviously want a little bit of the same aesthetic. Nice little river, some, some soldiers going on about their day. Now, we like to have all the little fun scenes that you would see in a Lego set. We've got a little banana in a tree hanging there. Kids love seeing that. It's a very popular, one of the, one of the best CMFs. People know it. They love it. Um, and then we've got a little wild cat who's chasing a monkey who's taunting him with a banana. And of course, my favorite mock is a rebuilt version of my childhood castle, which, if you notice, is brick built version of the wall panels that people might remember. Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, you've got these old themes, you've got fans, and, and they want to see themes that they're familiar with, but with a little bit of a twist. So we've got the ruin in the woods, a lot of things happening. We've got a great market, uh, a nice little UN of flags. I. I decided that, you know, they might fight and get into it on in the water, but on land, everybody really gets along. So I tried to put figs from, from kind of different eras of both castle, pirates, islanders, and all of that. They can come, pick spices, get their whatever flag pertains to them, fish, and then obviously what would a pirate cove be if when you lost a hand, you weren't able to grab a hook from somewhere and a parrot. And then everyone could just drink together here, hang out, enjoy some food at the bar, get along, park their canoes or whatever across, and go from there. So I built most of the buildings in here. Uh, the small one on the end I didn't do, and this church I didn't do. But we try to keep it random. It's not anchored in a specific time or place. It just feels like something you would imagine as, as a child. Not It's not Nassau. It's not San Juan. It's not any specific pirate town or from a, a you know media franchise. So... I mean, the, the whole thing looks spectacular, and I like a lot of these buildings here, so point out maybe some of the, the details on some of these that you worked on. So I build, obviously, sporadically, randomly, and all over the place. Um, I built that actual yellow one on, I believe it was for LEGOCon 2021. I did a little stop motion of kind of how I lay out different possibilities for architectural details and things. Uh, I wanted a lot of bright colors. Obviously, it's easy to kind of do a pirate town in all browns and things like that. But my thought is, when these when these places are first built, they're new, they're shiny, they're great. You know, they're not all ruins and things. Again, I try to keep it a little bit international, not anchored in a time. And of course, I also base my builds on what is available on the Pickerick Wall. So that coral building ended up being the one by four tiles with the studs on either side and I just had to kind of do some snot building to make it work as a building. I tried to keep it a little bit modular so that as as I'm placing it because obviously I didn't build half of this until this week and I never put it out. So I didn't really know where anything was going to go before I got here. So I try not to build things that are connected necessarily. So for example, this building here will come up and the little bar area is not part of it. And it's the same with the teal building. The little uh, add-on there is not part of it. So if I need to switch it to a different side, I can make that decision in the moment when I get here. You've got the old king going through a carriage. We've got a nice little board of, of possible commissions that pirates could take. And obviously swords, food, all the essentials that you could need. 
Now, I also want to give a shout out. You've got the parrot obviously represented here, which looks fantastic, very on brand. You also have your nails uh, color coordinated yes, with the buildings there. I should have switched the building's location. So I did pick colors that are specific to my two favorite buildings because details matter. Uh, th this is key. Yes. yes. Um, and then this is Cherry. So a nice, a nice young man named Everett came by and he gave me about 30 minutes of notes on how we could improve this. Uh, it was very helpful, so thank you, Everett. Very much appreciated. And he decided that Polly was maybe not the best name for my parrot uh, because he's red, so he should be called Cherry. So uh, this is Cherry. Nice to meet you, everybody. <laughs> well, fantastic work then. So I think that takes us on to the next builder. Hey, Joshua. Hey, hey, Beyond the Brick. How is everyone? Yeah, so my name is Joe Zawada. Um, I'm one of the contributors uh, for the uh, Charm City Cove. Uh, my contribution was the port in the middle. Um, you know, I, all of us helped with the landscaping across the whole thing, but that was kind of my, uh, my primary contribution. Um, when we were doing the initial planning, there was some uh, different ideas that were tossed around. Uh, so I, unfortunately, I got a, a bit of a late start, uh, but about last summer, we were able to, you know, finalize what I was going to be doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I started out with uh, looking for some inspiration photos. Uh, I looked up stuff from, uh, let's see, Pirates of the Caribbean, so you have like Port Royal, uh, video games such as Assassin's Creed, uh, and then as well as, I'm, I haven't watched the show, but I think it's called like Black Sails, Black Flags, something like that. Uh, so, you know, uh, content that is relevant to the period. Uh, it's not a period that I am particularly familiar with, so I relied more on source material uh, rather than my own uh, just remembered references. Uh, but yeah, so I... I felt that, you know, with all the ships, they needed some place to, you know, come into port and offload their wares and, you know, import and export, you know, the, that's, you know, how a lot of these uh, islands operated uh, to, you know, bring, shipping centers, yeah, shipping centers, you know, to, you know, integrate themselves into, you know, the world and economies of scale. Yeah. So, um, you know, you have all sorts of, you have a fish market. Um, I always try to incorporate, you know, some fun and levity. So instead, you know, your standard little silver mini fig fish, I decided to use the uh, the Mario, like collectible mini fig fish. So you have like a cheap cheap and a, that purple thing. Yeah, you have all sorts of good stuff. Um, one of the... the uh, real quick, I really like the roof on that building as well. Thank you, yeah, they're, they're the, the Wolverine claws in dark tan. Yeah, I got those a few years back. Uh, they were for some build years ago that got scrapped, and I was like, "Oh, hey, I need some. I need a thatched roof. Might as well pull these out. I have like ten thousand. I did not use all ten thousand. I still have plenty more to use at some point. They'll get to it eventually. Uh, yeah, but it, it was it was a great time to build. You know, one of the my build is unfortunately in the dead center, which means that um, if anything falls, it stays there. Uh, so, you know, we do have lots of, you know, animals and mini figs that have, you know, fallen to, you know, things such as scurvy, malnutrition, dysentery, you know, the whole lot, unfortunately. But, you know. It's a, it was a tough time. Yeah, it was a tough time. You know, life expectancy is, we should be grateful, you know, for modern medicine. You know, these, you know, pirate folk, they, they didn't have the luxuries of, you know, I don't know, Claritin Clear. I also really like the building on the end there and kind of the, the tiling to create the, the outside walls. Thank you. Thank you. So when I, most of my references were uh, more like British. I, if I'm wrong, no one in the comments correct me. I don't care. <laughs> I'm just putting that on the record. You'll be talking to yourself. Um, most of my stuff that I rely on and build and more familiar with is like Tudor and more like British, you know, style of architecture. Uh, but as things were kind of coming together, we started incorporating more French influences. And so what I kind of started doing was I was finding lots of French colonies used, uh, you know, painted wood siding, uh, like horizontal siding, and they were using colors like blues and grays rather than your browns and your tans that you would see in uh, British architecture. So yeah, that's kind of how uh, it came together. So there's like multiple cultural influences to tie it together. I added some flourishes on, you know, all the buildings to kind of make them more cohesive as a group to make this like general Western Central European uh, influenced uh, port. And then I like I like the ship just off off the dock right there as well. I think that is it coming to unload some cargo. 
Yeah, up in, uh, they, you know, you have to have Goombas. I think they're called a Goomba. They're offloading Goombas to the, uh, to the continent, to the new some world. foreign visitors. Yeah, yeah, some Koopas, some Goombas, all sorts of goodies. That's where they got the cheap cheeps. Mm -hmm. It's canon. Right. Yeah, I forgot about that. Thank you for, for creating that three line for me. They, they're bringing the, the, the weird Mario fish. There we go. Well, great work. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll keep moving down here. We got a, a little bit more like a landscaping area. It looks like we've got a couple of guys uh, roaming around here heavily armed. I like that, of course. You can see some like village figures out there. But then as we move to the beach section here, we start to get to a much more fortified area. So we've got our next builder here. If you want to introduce yourself and what did you do? Yeah, I'm Jason Miller, and uh, so I built, this is my take on the old El Dorado Fortress, the old Lego uh, Fortress set. So it basically takes up uh, 12 of the large gray base plates, and it's got over 200 soldiers inside the fortress. And unfortunately, you can't see it because it's, again, in the very middle, but it's actually fully detailed. If you can see through the windows and everything, you see the governor is having dinner. And, his, and this is bedchamber in there also. It goes into officer quarters after that. It goes, there's a grand staircase. There's barracks on the first floor. There's a kitchen, there's a dungeon. There's the warehouse that has lots of warehouse goods that no one can see. So, because we can't get the lid off because it's over there under the crane and it's in the middle. You but, guys went too expansive with it. <laughs> yeah, well, so I started out building this in my basement, and then it was, like, so massive. Like, well, we get it, we need to go bigger. And then we're like, well, it kind of needs to go bigger. And then, well, let's kind of square it off. And so then it went bigger. And so, you know, 150 of these great base plates later, here it is. So um, down in, the like, the little cove where the, the pirates are, you know, making their getaway and everything, headed back over to Cat's little cove island here, there's actually a little pier inside there, and there's a secret staircase that goes all the way up into to the base of the jail and everything. So they're escaping. So that's the idea there. Um, one of the other things is that we did uh, that I did on this is like the flowers, the vines. So those are the old um, from the old Octans gas stations. Just the fire uh, or the uh, like the nozzle piece for the green for the uh, what is it called the uh, the gas lines. Yeah. Yep. So, and, and the flowers are all on there just being held on by friction. That's it. So, they're not tied on, nothing like that. So, you could, like, pull it right off. But they're actually on there really, really good. But I love the flowering vines, all the foliage. We went crazy with that. We stayed up, like, lots of nights making trees. And and it takes a long time to do all that. And so, Kat and I were just making flower flowering vines like crazy. I love the the way you incorporated like the walls of the fortress into the rock work there, and how and how seamless that is. It really gives this idea that it was kind of built into the rock. Yep. So if you actually go back and look at the old El Dorado fortress, you're going to see like that that big pre-molded base plate that has it. But that's kind of how Lego did it back in the day of the of the walls coming right out of that old molded rock work and everything that they did. And we come to the first of several very impressive uh, ships here now as well. So. What can you tell us about the ships we have throughout here? So this is um, a take on the Silent Mary. This was actually a, a Lego set, but if you remember, there was the hull was unfinished and everything, and it was about half this size. So of course we had to make it bigger because bigger's better, right? So yeah, and then uh, and then of course it's so big that the sails that came with it were all tattered and everything. So I had all these Technic panels, and I'm like, well, I'll just try this out, and so. I'd end up using flex tube to hold it together because they're so heavy, but it works pretty good. And it kind of reminds me of the old sea cow from the Lego movie. They use Technic cells in that. We also have a ton of these uh, water plates here. So how many, how many are there total in the layout? So, so as far as like water plates themselves, there's uh, about 125 water plates. There's like well over a hundred thousand trans tiles to make up the water. So, uh, yeah, my thumbs were sore a lot, like putting all the water down. And then as we come around to this side of the fort, you see kind of like a cargo crane there and all the soldiers lined up, I saw all bristling with cannons on the yeah. side. Yeah, so there's actually so there's three decks on this side and actually down into the down into the rock work is where the dungeons are. And then there's the gun deck and then there's the second floor, which is kinda of like barracks and just like living quarters, and then there's another gun deck above that, and then of course the top. Uh, the front side up here is the warehouse side, 
right below there is the medical, like, you know, the first aid. So whenever Joseph infects everyone with plague and everything, they have to come here to get better. And you've got another impressive ship docked there. It looks like troops unloading. Yep. So this is the garrison for the fortress. So we act I actually have about 3,000 redcoats. Uh, in this display, we only have about 350 total. But, yeah, like, basically they're coming over. And Cat is French, but these are English, so we're taking over the French settlement of Nassau. So, so yeah, these are all three basically British frigates and just offloading troops. But now we've got this bad guy coming in, so we're dispatching one of the ships to come over and try to help intercept it. So that's the story. Fantastic work. We'll, we'll check out a little bit of a different section here now then as well. Perfect. So what do you have for us here? Hi. Uh, so this is my Islander's Cove. Uh, when our group decided we were going to do this collab, uh, Jason came to me and was like, hey, we're doing pirates. And I'm a good uh, 90s kid. And so uh, as a kid, I could never afford the like actual big pirate ships because those were like, you know, like the flagship sets for the theme. Uh, but I could afford the Islanders sets, uh, which were always like the, at the, God, at that time, they were like maybe 15 bucks, right? It's the little tiny, like one Islander, one pirate or whatever. Exactly, yeah. And so I was like, well, this is the perfect sub theme to make part of this uh, and be a little nostalgic to uh, people here at the show who are my age. <laughs> uh, and it just started uh, with the mask that is right there in the front, that big red tiki mask. I was fooling around in studio. Uh, I had the the tiki mask from the old sets. Uh, and I was like, hey, I wonder if I can make this as a brick built thing, right? Um, and how cool would it be if it's then integrated into the mountain? And um, it was just kind of went organically from there. Uh, you'll see behind the mask, uh, there's a very familiar element of the skull behind it, uh, which is actually just from like a Ninjago set uh, that they had. Uh, and I, I got that set from a friend, and I was like, this is actually really, really cool. And it's the perfect size to be a creepier behind the scenes of the Tiki mask. Uh, looking through it, I kind of focus on practicing landscaping, um, which is something that uh, I've always been a, a modular city builder. And so this felt like a really good opportunity to work on organic shapes uh, and landscaping. And I wanted to create as much with the storytelling as I could. So. The, the pathway goes completely through the mountain. And so there's like on this side, uh, like a pit that has skeletons and stuff below where kind of you could do your sacrifices. Um, and there's a, a steps going up that mountain so that the minifigs can actually get from one side to the other. Um, the fun little thing uh, in addition to that is the very back of the mountain has a guy hanging off of it uh, and I, gosh, it was like 2019, we had like a gift with purchase that was one of the brick built larger Lego bricks, like a two by four. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, hey, that's really cool. How funny would it be if the Islanders were like, rather than like an Easter Island head, they were building giant Lego bricks. Uh, and so he's like carving it out of the side of the mountain. The hut on the other side of it uh, has someone, another guy finishing up the sculpture, right? Um, but yeah, it was just a, a lot of fun. Uh, collecting all of the old Islander minifigs that are very hard to find now um, and looking for ways to build a set that has play features and little hidden items like a treasure chest hidden under the tiki mask and things like that. So One of my favorite elements from those sets was always the printed canoe and I know you've got one on like the back corner there as well. I, yeah, absolutely. I ordered a lot of canoes in hopes to find the best quality ones so I have like Gosh, I had an order of like 20 of them and then it was like, let's see which one actually comes in as said, used, but like new, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So, so in your mind, do the uh, Islanders interact with the, the mainlanders over there or how does that work? They do, yeah, actually, as a matter of fact. So as we were coming up with the narrative of the, the overarching uh, display, uh, we knew that it was like pirates versus like the colonialism because we, we wanted like a true to history part. And I looked and I was like, well, the Islanders are there, but they're the neutral party in this one. We don't have to have like colonialism that actually is like offensive in any way, but they can be the cool guys over here doing their thing. Uh, and there's a, a, an Islander who has beached his canoe over on the mainland uh, and is walking to the bar to join his friends. So a little bit of interaction, but nothing too crazy. They're not the main threats here. There we go. 
Well, thank you. Great work. Appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you. We'll keep moving down the line here. We've got another really fantastic island here. So if you want to introduce yourself and what is this? All right. Hi, my name is Slade Vantine and this is Shark Island. And I actually just wanted to make an island and it didn't work right. And it was just sand and it didn't look good. So then I started adding rocks and then I was playing around with the small um, underwater, half underwater sharks. And then I said, you know what? I need to make the whole island. And it just expanded from there. And then uh, my son said, hey, it needs a little more oomph. So we put the old sunken ship in to give it that effect. And, and then I love the nature scene. So we just filled it up as much as we could with vegetation and uh, tried to make it yeah. stand out and, and be unique and, and still fit in with the whole overall plan of, of Jason's huge pirate theme. I love the idea for like an animal shaped island like this. Talk about kind of the the rock work and getting that body shaping down using all those pieces. Yeah, that, that took a while of work. Um, it's definitely snot and laid on the side and staggered and lots of technique pieces inside to hold each one at its elevation. So I actually laid out the uh, dark tan tile first and then uh, built up to it. So I kind of worked from the water up um, for the build. So it worked out well. I also love the variations in color on the water tiles around here and it creates so much depth to the build. It, it, it definitely does. And, and adding the tan for the sunken ship really helped and, and gives it a lot of pop, which I, I love. <laughs> yeah. well, excellent work, thank you. So as we move down, you can see another fantastic view of the fortress there as well with the, the ramp uh, going up there, very reminiscent of the original kind of El Dorado fortress that that is based on. Kind of see into the, the courtyard a little bit there and all of the soldiers getting ready to protect themselves against any potential threats as well. But we've got another fantastic island that we'll move over here and show now. So another builder, if you want to introduce yourself and what do you have? All right, uh, my name is Kevin Dark. Uh, I'll be honest, I am not as good at scenery building as my fellow builders. So with my island, I wanted to go with more of uh, telling stories with minifigs. So what I have here is a rocky island, which I call Rock Island because names are hard. Uh, you have a bunch of pirates that have snuck onto the island here and they're planning a surprise attack on the passing colonial ship. So there's a bunch of cannons spread throughout the island. Uh, up at the top there, you have the pirate captain who's uh, looking through her spyglass and, and yelling, it's time to attack. And her trusted monkey there is uh, blowing on the bugle, letting everyone know. And at the side there, there's pirates uh, running in with just any weapons they can get, so brooms and pots and pans. Uh, down here underneath the rock, you can see the little uh, pirate treasure cove with a couple of pirates that have just have decided to avoid the battle and they've snuck off and uh, are being haunted as a result. Uh, and over here, uh, this is a woman that didn't know there was a battle going on. She's just over there just fishing for some clams. And uh, also when I finished this, I had a lot of leftover minifigs. So I just started putting them on other people's areas. So if you come uh, like over here, we have uh, a couple, uh, couple soldiers that have been sent out to recover a lost anchor, which is uh, slightly more than a two person job. And over here, there are some soldiers in training. You can tell that because they have their uh, blue training uniforms. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I have a lot of like little vignettes that I have going on here. There's a pirate that's being captured. Uh, I tried to tell a story that the uh, soldiers are generally hungry. So there's one uh, trying to catch a bunny. There's one over there trying to catch a clam with a spear. They're uh, stealing some cabbage over there. And uh, you know, I'll be honest, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. This whole build, most people look at it and go, oh, this is about pirates, or oh, this is about uh, uh, the fortress and uh, colonial soldiers, and stuff like that. It's really, it's about one thing, and that's the banana in the tree. Yes. The banana in the tree, this is what the whole build's about. <laughs> Everything else, it's just filler, because the one tree didn't seem like enough, so we just kept build building out to really kind of kind of make it a full build. Context is key. Exactly. You need the context because if it's just a, a banana in a tree, you're like, well, where is the tree? Is it in the Caribbean? What time is it? What, what, where does it take place? So this really gives it context of the banana in the tree. Yes, I love it. Well, great work there. I love the, the ambush idea with all of the, the pirates over there on the rock island. So I'm sure that'll be a spectacular battle about to take place there. Uh, hopefully, yeah. I mean, they're not very well armed. A lot of the cannons aren't quite facing the right direction, but I'm sure they'll have fun with it. Yes. Thank you so much. Good work there.
Thank you. And uh, Joe, I wanted to bring you back in. I know you worked on uh, a lot of the landscaping here. I, I watched you during some of the setup days, kind of putting trees down and stuff. So talk about kind of like your approach to landscaping and how that works with some of a layout like this. Well, a great start when doing landscaping is you find someone else to pay for it. That's my big tip. So uh, you spoke with him earlier, the guy who built the, Jason who yeah. built the fort. Um, he has the, of the members, he had the largest collection of just brick and space available. Uh, so we had a general idea of how the island was going to be laid out. And then uh, without any monetary investment on my part, I got to raid my friend's Lego room and uh, Kat as well. And we utilized the pieces that he had. He has a fabulous collection, a fabulous Lego room. And uh, we started out, you know, with the trying to form a gradient, knowing where, okay, these are going to be the high points, the low points. We have the, the trodden earth where there's going to be high traffic. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of where we started is kind of a, uh, a mental map and then a physical map of kind of where we wanted buildings and where we expected, you know, elements to, to take place. Uh, and once you have that in line, you can start mapping out, you know, little scenes and where, where things would make for, you know, good interest points. Cause you know, as a big display, you want areas to for people to look at all over the place you don't just want all the interest at one spot individual stories kind of sprinkled throughout exactly so once you have the stories and the general idea then you can start formulating a plan for the landscaping so i think we, we started in the the corner at, near the town uh, for the main island starting with you know the the creek that you're now seeing that's where uh we got started uh you know planning with the, the water going into the main uh, cove, and then the pathway going into the town. And then once we got through here, the elevation that we established on this side kind of formed the rest as we moved uh, along the way through the rest of the town. Yeah. I also love the, the different tree variations you guys have here as well. Thank you, yeah, our, uh, our buddy Jason, he is great at, he's like the social media savvy one of all of us, and he takes a lot of time researching, you know, great techniques that we can utilize on all of our displays. Uh, yeah, he, he, he put a lot of thought into this and it was able to, you know, give us a kind of a, a general consensus of kind of, this is what our vegetation is gonna look like, palm tree type A, B, and C. Uh, yeah, to make, you know, a beautiful cohesive display where the vegetation, you know, makes sense. Fantastic work. So what was the final count on how many people were involved in the layout? So there were uh, six people who had mapped out established areas and then we had, you know, I think like two or three more people who had, you know, standalone buildings. And then um, while we were on site, while we were spending days working on it, we had a few more people who, you know, friends of ours who wanted to get a mock in, wanted to get, you know, a little scene in. So, you know, you might have seen it. There's people building sand castles that we can credit our friend Bailey. Uh, there's a Bionicle Island. Uh, a buddy of ours, Will, makes bionicle mocks and he's like hey i have a palm tree island can i throw it in so at the end of it we probably had maybe a total of 10 bodies who worked on it uh a lot of people helping us at the show but the core group was six and then a phenomenal group of folks afterward who uh, really helped it come together at the end on site it's a whole spectacular layout so thanks to you and everyone who put in all the work and effort to not only build but also get this massive layout set up at the show here. It looks spectacular. So thank you and can't wait to see what you all do in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm Joshua Hanlon here at Brickworld Indy and I am joined by Scott Wright, a talented builder who we have actually featured in the past. And last year he had his Pirates of the Caribbean display here at Brickworld Indy, but you've made it about twice the size and added so much more. So we wanted to do kind of a 2.0 update video with you to show all of the cool new things you've added. So if you just want to kind of start at the end down here and we'll work our way down and let's take a look. All right, well, last year I had rebuilt Port Charles in the cliff area and I only had two of my big ships on. And after the show was over, I decided it was time to do an update and for three months from this area right here all the way down was a complete rebuild. Last year, the Cannibal Island and Isle de Murda were combined into one. I separated them. I've got all my ships on there. I expanded the town area a great deal. Uh, I've added the Kraken attack. I added uh, Poseidon's throne. Uh, 
there are 143 base plates. There's over 300 minifigures. And like I said, I spent about three months doing the rebuild on it. So I've added quite a bit. Quite the project. What are the logistics for you as a builder when you're working on something of this size that, that takes up this much space? As you're at home, what's that like for you? I have an eight foot table that I build it section by section. As one section is complete, I move that off the table, start with the next section so everything flows together. I actually had to put this up in my garage so I could actually see it all together to make sure that everything was coming out the right way. And it, my wife didn't like it because I took the space up in the car, from the car, but uh, yeah, as you can see, it turned out pretty nice. <laughs> So if we focus on the island right now, let's maybe look at the town here and then some of the kind of general landscaping and point out what we have going on. Okay. Well, you just have a general town area here, and I've expanded on it. I think my I had five or six buildings last year. And I, as you can see, I, I, I saw the cathedral on it. It's a Pirates of the Caribbean online game. That was one of their snapshots on there, so I had to put the cathedral on there. You might... See Captain Hook down there selling some weapons. Uh, you got Peter Pan on the roof here. The, there are four buildings that have interiors in them. Here's the tavern. As you can see, it has a local population that's pretty busy. <laughs> One guy's laying outside. He's inebriated to the point that he spilled his liquor. And then over here, we have the King's Storehouse, and when we take the roof off of it, you can see it's got all those weapons and cannons and black powder barrels and stuff like that in there. I have two other buildings that have complete interiors in them too, but it uh, takes a little bit to get the roofs off, so we right. just did these two. That's nice. You got like the armory there, you got a couple guards out front, so that's kind of what all the soldiers would use. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I've expanded the jungle section quite a bit. Uh, I have to thank your viewers. I got a lot of good feedback last year online. Uh, there are still ideas that I'm working on that were given to me online last year. Uh, I plan on uh, rebuilding this ship right here. Uh, I'm going to do some more wave action that people have been asking about. Jack sliding down the cable was an idea that came over your channel so that's that's a helpful hint i love all the helpful hints that people give me on feedback Perfect. i'm glad we we're able to inspire that i think people love seeing uh, the big impressive builds like this well it just shows what kind of viewership you have you have all these people worldwide that are watching you and they they critique you to the point that you say yeah i need to do that too there you go that's the goal i noticed with your trees here so you kind of use the classic pirate tree uh, technique there instead of kind of brick building them yourself. Do you like that look of the classic kind of 90s era pirate sets? Yeah, I like the old palm trees. I have quite a collection of them. <laughs> There's a, I think I have two tubs that takes to carry all my trees and bushes and stuff right. in. So There's a lot of green here. There's also a little bit of yellow on this section. What's happening back here? Well, the yellow brick road took a little magic turn through the Pirates of the Caribbean set. <laughs> With the new collector series coming out, when I saw the Wizard of Oz figures, I just had to have them and I had to add them to this because that was always one of my favorite movies. As growing up, it scared me when I was a kid, but I love the movie now. So I just had to add that in there this weekend. Yep, and then if we keep moving down here, so you mentioned some of what we have down here. John's shown kind of the rock section. What's that? That's Isle of Murda. That's where you see them in the first movie. They're they turned into the uh, skeletons in the moonlight. I wanted to do that a little better last year. So actually that was the first part that I started rebuilding on. That was the first section I rebuilt. And then I separated and made the Cannibal Island a separate unit. And I wanted to do the bridge. That seemed to be a big part in the movie. So I, I wanted to get it in there really nice. And then I was able to add the Queen Anne's Revenge and uh, Flying Dutchman. Last year they didn't travel well, and they ended up being puddles of pieces in the bottom of my box, so I didn't put them out for display. But they went, both of them went under rebuilds, and they're very sturdy now, and they travel very good. Now, are these either official kits, or is this all custom built, these ships? The Queen Anne's Revenge is a Lego 
but it's customization. They did not make the Flying Dutchman, so that is completely custom. Yeah. Well, what were some of the challenges with that one there? Because obviously it doesn't have quite the design of a normal looking ship. It's also a very different color than a regular ship. So Actually, it took about three rebuilds for me to get it the way. And it's just my version. Don't get all upset because it's not exactly like in the movie, but it is my version of the Flying Dutchman. Uh, the sails are actually off of uh, Black Pearl set, and I bleached them until I got that color. So that, that's how I got that brownish color on the sails for the Flying Dutchman. And it's, uh, I've got uh, most of the crew members on there that are recognizable. Uh, same with all my ships. I try to get them as crewed with all the, the major players that are on those ships in the movie. Right. So then, it, you know, it's definitely recognizable because of that. So that works really well. So with this massive layout, what's it like when you transport to the show and set it up? Is that a long, tiring process for you? I done pretty good yesterday, it only took five hours. Last time I set up, it was over six hours. I actually have everything on video on my tablet. I've also got a map of it drawn out. Between the two, I can watch it on video and see. It's like a big jigsaw puzzle, it just all goes together. And once you get to a certain point, then it all starts clicking. Yeah, this is, this is the way it goes together. Another little trick I do is like on these corners right here, I put the same shape on there and so those corners match and then the next one down will be half rounds or quarter rounds and then those match so I just use those as little markers to help put the sections together. You match the shapes up and then it's a lot easier when you're setting it up. Right, right because as big as this is even I forget and this is only the third time I've seen it all together myself so it, it surprises me sometimes. <laughs> oh I forgot that goes there. <laughs> But another unique thing about this layout is that you have it all on the floor, which is great because I think it's down low for the kids to see. But kind of what led you to that decision and how do you find that works out as the, you know, the show goes on? During our Indie Lug meetings, that was one of the things discussed. We wanted to be able for all the visitors, no matter how small, to enjoy being able to see without having to peer over the top of a table. And this being as large as it is, I decided that it would be a lot easier just go directly to the floor. In a way, it makes it a lot easier put together. Uh, but I'm very sore this morning. I'm getting too old for the crawling around on the floor for five hours. <laughs> that's, that's the big challenge right there. <laughs> yes, it is. At my age, it is. Yeah, well, I'm glad you put in the work because you definitely can see how, how kids just have so much a better view. I mean, now they basically have a top-down view uh, and can spot so many more details rather than kind of trying to peer up above a table. I've had a lot of good comments about it. That's great. Well, fantastic. I'm so glad you put in that work, and thanks for continuing to expand this and into what you've done this year. Is there is there hopes to add even more? Very possible. <laughs> I've got ideas. I mean, the franchise allows for that, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, they're very, it's very possible it could get larger. It's always dangerous when you start getting ideas. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Especially me. <laughs> <laughs> well, great work. Thank you so much, Scott, for taking us through again. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. it. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Joshua Hanlon at Brickfest in Lima, Peru. And today we've got this awesome Pirates Imperial collaborative display. So we've got both of the builders here, and they're going to take us through this whole big display. So if you want to introduce yourselves, then we'll jump on into it. Okay, my name is John Talledo. My name is Raul Delgado. And we are constructing this port. It's so, so big. And I have mm, eight, eight ships and a lot of boats. And John? Yeah, so as you can see, he has created all of this. Actually, he has more uh, ships. Yeah, but he just had time to... To bring this only so much space and time yes and we need also more space yeah but uh, we are going to uh, make it bigger next year okay yeah because this is actually my first well actually the second time that i'm presenting this uh, he started like five years ago six years okay ago. six years ago okay so he has 
a lot more pieces on me. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, uh, so yeah. what do we have going on in the in the scene that it looks like the pirate ships are coming here? Uh, it's an invasion. Uh, there are a lots of ships. This is the the small port, and this is the the fort, a little fort. It's it's a mix between old sets, new sets, and my own creations. This is a Harry Potter structure, by adapted to pirates. A uh, lots of boats, and this is an invasion. So it's an old idea. My last um, exposition, my, la my last expo was in five years ago. Uh, oof, a lot of work. I just get married, and I, I don't have time. So, but the the next year we have to fusion be be between three people, and double. Vamos a duplicar. We are going to double. Oh, yeah, double in size. Yes, in size. Yeah. Double the number of ships. Um, a port so much bigger, so the, the, the next year this will be huge, really huge. That's awesome, it's already great. So one thing that you notice right away is the number of minifigs, particularly like the Imperial minifigs here. Do you know how many you have? Uh, here, um, 200, but I have 500 more, but I don't have time. The, and I, I have um, a lot of base plates, sand, sand base plates but I have um, a limit of space. But the next year we, we have to, to build, to build um, a huge port with beach, with beach, with islands, and probably we will put um, 1,000 1, 1, of minifigures. That will be awesome. Well, let's keep moving down here then. So take a closer look at some of the ships because you've got a lot going on. I really like the one that's tipping over back there. Ah, that idea was yesterday. Yesterday, uh, a cousin. I have uh, spare, spare, spare ships. I don't have time to build another ships. Uh, there are in boxes. Um, there are an incomplete ship, but este, we pusimos un. They put, they designed that on the spot. Oh, oh, so just here at the show. Yeah. Yesterday at 4, 4 p.m. So the, the next year, three of, of these, at least. Do you have a favorite ship here of all of these? Uh, this. Yes, the, the small boats because they are fast. They're, they are fast. They are um, the most close to the beach. And the pirates just jump to the boats and then invade the port. <laughs> the, um, the 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 bigger ships uh, will be the the backup. So this is the fastest. So uh, go to the beach and invade the port. Oh, you've got their whole strategy planned out for yes. them. <laughs> Little boats, uh, smaller small ships, and bigger ships. This is the the, the sequence. Well, it's great. So we'll keep moving down then. Uh, so you've got the, the big ships you mentioned, and then we've got another section here with these big waves. So what's happening here? Well, as you can see here, uh, we have uh, this uh, ship that is escaping from these two other ships and trying to capture this. But there is a problem over there with a uh, Kraken <laughs> yes, that is helping some way uh, the pirates, okay, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. I, I love this little scene over here <laughs> with the guy shooting yes. out the back of the rowboat. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, it was something that uh, I just did today, okay, to give, <laughs> you know, kind of flow to, to this set. Mm -hmm. And these are quite large waves, a lot of pieces in there. So is that all like solid, just stacked bricks? It's not solid. No, it's not that solid. It, it, the base, like uh, three or four floors are solid but the last part as uh, you can see here uh, we have like a hole inside and on, only some structures okay to build the crest of the the wave mm -hmm. so do you want to build more waves and layouts like this in the future as well will that be part of the larger yes, layout so what we are planning is to to double this okay so i'm going to be in charge of the island because i have the pieces to build an island the problem was that uh, since i just arrived from uh, my trip, because I was on vacation, I just had the only one night to create this because I have more pieces. 
but we are going to create an island. I want to be in charge of the island and school island. Uh, then with a storm in the middle, like um, a Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, yeah. Yes, and with a Kraken in the middle. So that, that's our plan for the next uh, expo. Yeah. Well, that's great work. Thank you, both of you guys. Uh, wonderful layout. Look forward to seeing more in the future. So hi, I'm, I'm Dan Capoza. Uh, this is the Lookout Point Fort. This is my first time uh, having a mock on display, but this is probably the fifth iteration of me uh, building this. So uh, throwback to the old El Dorado Fortress, uh, you know, Black Seas Barracuda, uh, 89, 90s, like Pirate Series 1. Uh, I got a couple of those sets and built them and you know, sort of jammed them together, um, Lagoon Lockup and El Dorado Fortress. And then said, I can do better. Took it apart, put it back together a little bigger, took it apart. So this was probably six years and five iterations of tearing it apart and putting it back together. Uh, so in my mind, the, the, fun, the fun story to tell in this genre isn't the pirates versus the soldiers. It's the blue coats versus the red coats. So what we have here is the red coats and the pirates are working together. They're, they're trying to invade. They're doing an amphibious landing here. Uh, against the blue coat fort, so the uh, the blue coats are now sallying out. They're they're trying to hold them off at the bridge. You can see they got bayonets fixed and they're ready to defend. Uh, red coats and the pirates are taking some casualties coming ashore. Um, we have you know with them some of the some of the ships. We've got my daughter's uh, Barracuda Bay. You can see it's complete with Princess Aurora, which her name is Aurora. Um, and the unicorn DJ from the from music sets, uh, so and a bunch of friends crew in the guns too. Uh, this one, uh, the red coat ship, uh, was just my my creation, sort of freehand, uh, using the Viking longship hull for it. Uh, and so these guys are offloading the red coats and the pirates coming ashore in their longboats, and then uh, inside the fort. Uh, being a history nerd, wanted to try and get an artillery fortress where we've got slope walls, where the profile's low. Uh, a little worried that as a kid would come up and look at this, they would just see the blank wall. So I tried to make it a little exciting. So we've got a couple of explosions. You got a cannonball splashing in. One, one cannonball impacting uh, one of the gun positions there. And then tried to jam as many mini, mini figures up top as we could to show, you know, show, show there's stuff, some stuff going on. Because a lot of the kids coming in aren't, aren't going to be able to look down into the fort. Uh, so trying to balance some of the classic you know, white and yellow style of the El Dorado Fortress and the old Pirates theme. A little bit of history nerd, uh, you know, true artillery style fortress. Um, tried to bring the scale up because when you saw the old uh, El Dorado Fortress next to the Black Seas Barracuda, like the, the Barracuda is huge in the 14, you know, 32 by 32 base plate. So... Uh, it's been a couple iterations, but I'm I'm really happy with it. Uh, it was my first time having stuff on display, uh, and I'm I'm excited. A lot of people reacted well. A lot of people are excited about it, so I'm having a good time. It's a great showing for your first display here. I love this. This is one of my all-time favorite eras for Lego themes: the El Dorado Fortress, uh, just all of the, the 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 blue coats, the red coats, pirates. So so in your mind, what's kind of the backstory with the red coats and the pirates teaming up together? Uh, and so, um, hey, the, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? <laughs> so, uh, big, big fort for the blue coats. So clearly the blue coats are the power in the area. Uh, and then the only way the red coats were going to be able to overwhelm them and throw it off would be if they teamed up with the pirates. So a marriage of convenience will <laughs> say, uh, not sure how long it's going to last. Personally, I'm a big blue coats fan. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are, are tracking the uh, Brethren of the Brick Seas. There's a little online community through Eurobricks. Uh, that's they, these guys built this whole world of pirates, merchants, the red coats and the blue coats, uh, and a little you know built a bunch of maps, built a bunch of cities, and and so uh, in in the in the bowels of the internet, in the depths of the internet, there's an ongoing epic battle between the red coats and the blue coats. So uh, happy to bring a little bit of uh, that forward. Now, one thing that's great about the fort is you've got this very detailed courtyard as well with all of the kind of gray streets throughout there. What all is happening in that section? Yeah, so uh, three weeks ago, as I, this was coming together, that was just solid gray base plate. And I was like, oh, this is terrible. It, it, look, it looks gross. So 
uh, sat down and tried and think about what I wanted to do uh, with it and ended up going through and you know, put the wood panel, uh, you know, the wood tiles for the panel here and then did uh, stonework on top and then cobblestone down in the bottom. Much happier with how it looks now than it did three weeks ago. Uh, we've got the commander of the fort is, you know, dispatching a letter into the town, telling them, hey, like, I think we got this. I think we're going to be okay. I think we're going to stop them. But also, you know, just in case, be ready. Still, still a hard fought thing. Uh, so he's got his runner with his horse there being held, getting, getting ready to head out. Uh, we got a couple soldiers running around. We got another unit of troops on the backside that are heading out to the bridge to help reinforce. Uh, we've got some some casualties being taken across here. You know, one of the things to balance a bunch of kids running around. So this is pretty gruesome. The guy lost his leg, but he's tucked down inside the courtyard. So a lot of the little kids aren't going to be able to see him. Uh, and then uh, so they've got uh, a, a, a priest right at the time. We don't have medics necessarily. We've got uh, the clergy are there to help. Uh, and we got a bunch of soldiers running around, moving things around, looking looking busy, reinforcing the guns. Um, tried to make sure we've got you know powder and we've got cannonballs. Uh, they've got. Uh, I tried to build some of the stuff for the gun crews. So it's not just you know a cannon, right? Because it, it takes a lot. Um, so yeah, and then we have we have two different units. We have our our red epauletted grenadiers. Uh, who are, are the infantry, or and my favorites, or fixing bayonets, are the ones coming out. And then really the garrison of the fort, who are the ones manning the guns, that's your white epaulets. Um, one of my figures that I, I really like is uh, this guy from the pirates, uh, from the pirate side, but he goes well, he fits right in, so the entire uh, blue coat crew is basically crewed by these guys. And uh, so they're, they're good guys in my book. And you've got this great tower over here uh, that has the, the blue coat figure there, and I think he ties in with the ship over there as well. That's right. So uh, we made some room for the for the large display of the Peterson brothers and their amazing castle because they take that all apart. So uh, we shifted everything down a little bit, but the, the frigate, the blue coat ship, had been over on the other side. There's actually a wigwag, uh, signal, signalman receiving signals and talking to the signalman who's up in the lighthouse there. Uh, we've got the captain of the ship uh, trying to keep, keep, keep the ship up. They're, they're just coming out of the harbor to join the battle and start uh, fighting back. Um, this design here, I, I put this one together. Uh, it's the Friends Dolphin, uh, dolphin Tour Boat. Yacht Cruise. Yeah, the Yacht Cruise, right? So it's still got the little decals on there because I'm afraid to take them off. But... Uh, um, yeah, so this is just a ship built, you know, once once that white hull was out, I really wanted to make, like, a, a good guy frigate. Um, so I'm pretty happy with that guy. Uh, and then, yeah, the so the corresponding guy that's up in the tower, up in the lighthouse there, is uh, the guy with the wigwag. The lighthouse is, like, a cauldron full of, uh, full of flame bits, and it burnt out because last night we had, uh, like, all the lights off so that everybody could see all the displays lit up. Uh, the only lights that I put in here, that's kind of a new thing for me, is uh, in the lighthouse, in the, in the roof, there's a light that actually shone down uh, into the cauldron so that it would be lit up. Uh, it burnt out last night, but it's there. Uh, first, first step, uh, dabbling and putting lights in. Um, and then I also you know, just tried to, thinking about it being something fun for everybody to come and look at, so of course we got Elsa and Anna doing like a Last of the Mohicans scene, like sneaking out of the fort uh, as the fort's under attack, um, and then uh, yeah, uh, the the Barracuda Bay ship has got uh, all sorts of you know friends and, and Princess Aurora on it as well. I love these classic Islanders canoes there and those characters. They're so great. So uh, once I have the room, the time, and the money. Uh, the, this is going to curve around into a large bay and, uh, you know, all the docks and all the buildings uh, for the town that the fort's protecting behind it. And then, uh, you know, palm trees continuing off into the woods that will eventually have an islander village right on the far end of it. Uh, that's what's going on in my head. We'll see, see if we ever get there. Um, now, you mentioned there's a couple different types of minifigures here. So uh, are some of these, like, newer designs or some of the original kind of from the 90s? So here on the bridge and the ones with the red epaulets, that is my favorite minifig. That's the original uh, blue coat soldier. Uh, El Dorado Fortress came with a handful of them. Uh, Caribbean Clipper came came with them, but they had the, the 
the three point hats instead of the Shaco. Um, but that's that's my favorite favorite minifig of all time. When they did the Pirate Series Two, they did the white epaulets. I've actually mixed and matched the uh, Pirate Series Two. Actually had the the paint, the red feather, and the crest on the Shaco, and uh, the Pirate Series One was just a straight black Shaco. Uh, so I I dressed my my Grenadiers up uh, a little bit, the red epaulets, and then the fancy Shaco. Uh, but that's it. That that's my all time favorite minifig. Those uh, classic soldiers to fight the pirates. Now with a big battle like this, do, do you know how many minifigures are in the layout in total? So uh, I I didn't even think of it. Somebody asked me about an hour ago, and I, I meant to sit down. And I'm, I'm I, by by the end of this, I'm going to have an answer for you. Um, I have no idea, and uh, I I, I got to get back to you on that one. It's, but. Uh, you know, I wanted to make it. I wanted to make it busy. I wanted to make it crowded. I wanted to see how many longboats I could jam in there. Um, and uh, you know, they're my favorite guys, so I wanted to, I wanted to show them off. I wanted to have them have them all out there uh, fighting the fight. So, yeah. and we haven't mentioned yet some great landscaping. The kind of the whole fort, whole fort is built up on this rock work here, which is great. So, what's that like structurally under there? So uh, f funny, there's actually a lot of Duplo under there because they're they're integratable, and uh, so you know one of the guys that I build with in the online community uh, had shown like the backside of a bunch of his stuff. He had, it was all jammed with Duplo, and he had some really dynamic landscape. I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because the mass, you know, this is uh, sort of three 32 inch base plates by like two and a half deep for the actual land mass. And it's six or, or seven or eight bricks high. Like that is a lot of space. Like there's a lot of a lot of mass. And it took uh, so it's mostly lattice, you know, towers, and then cross beams holding it up, and then uh, plates on top. Uh, a couple iterations of building this. Uh, it's worth investing the time to make it more sturdy under there than than just good enough to hold it up. Because once you start building on top of it. Uh, you know, there's spots where it's squishy, you know, like as you're putting a minifigure in, the whole floor is giving way. So it's a little more robust than previous iterations of this underneath. There's still more empty space than anything else, and it's also, you know, technicolored, mixed match, duplos, uh, decal things. It's, it's it's a crazy mess underneath. But um, it took a well, it took a long time. You know, so so much of this, and this is the largest thing I've done. And uh, still, even knowing in my head and having a couple iterations, it just takes a long time to build this much, this much land mass to put something on top of. So, so obviously, you're trying not to go too parts intensive, but using the Duplo, which is a great pro tip. Do you have any idea how many parts are in the, the whole layout? I have no idea. So again, this, it's been about a year to build what you're looking at right now. Uh, you know, so slowly off and on as I had time. But it was probably two thirds of the size, um, and we, you know, we were getting ready to move. And it was about two thirds of size, size, and we tore it all apart, uh, and then moved and, and have since rebuilding it. So it um, wasn't a deliberate effort as much as it's the latest iteration of something that I'm probably five iterations into. And really, at that point, with all the iterations, it's probably seven or eight years that I've been tinkering from a lagoon lockup and an Eldorado fortress sort of jammed together yeah. with a handful of extra pieces to what it is right now. Yeah. Well, I hope to see you expand on this in the future. This is such a fun theme and there's so many possibilities with all these different factions here. Awesome. Hey, I, I'm glad you guys like it. it was, like I said, it's my first time having something on display and uh, you know, sitting next to, to, to the legend of the Peterson brothers is pretty, pretty cool. I'm glad a lot of folks have stopped by to talk about it, so I'm excited. Yeah. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work. Thanks, guys. Brian Benson, Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, so, yeah, we decided to do a pirate island this year. And the whole idea started with a wrecked pirate ship and turned into all of this. Um, we've got a couple things that move starting down here. We've got uh, a squid that comes in and out very, very slowly. Had some gearing challenges there. And then uh, we've got the sharks that swim around the wreck all day long. There's a pirate down there that's meeting his fate as we speak. Um, and then, I mean, obviously the detail in the coral. So my wife does uh, plant work. She does a very good job, as you can see here. So she did all of that painstakingly. And there's some, some creative uses of pieces in there. The, those are the turbines that are at Lego stores right now and purple and lots of hair, actually. And then the Aztec 
weapons there from the CMF line. So, and then we're big Disney fans, so we like to hide Disney things all around. We've got Sebastian, uh, Flounder, Little Mermaids in the back, and just lots of lots of vegetation and animals. We love critters. Yeah. That's what I love about underwater builds is just how colorful it is and all of the little details that you can put in there. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It, it's time consuming, right? Because you try as best as you can to make things look unique instead of rebuilding. So you get something that's cool, you do one or two, and then you have to make something else that's cool and repeat, you know? Even so. just the variety of fish colors now that Lego has, that, that adds so much to it. Yeah, I actually, uh, I mean, you don't think about it in like a coral scene, but the black fish, right, is just amazing there aren't very many of them so i'm glad i have a couple hopefully they stay there through the whole con and then the, the broken ship is also a fantastic part of this model here yeah thank you we uh so we actually built the ship completely and then tore it in a half and you know gave it the the uh, look as if the wood is splintered and um uh, batman's hiding down in the in the ship uh, mermaid batman's down in there so that's his his bat cave now isn't it yeah i think he's staying trying to stay away from the sharks <laughs> but yeah it's very authentic then when you build it as one model and then just actually break it in half yeah exactly and and i am not a ship builder at at all this is loosely based based on a, a lego set and i tried to piratize it um it's actually a colonial so um, then changed, you know, the back end up a little bit. But first time doing a ship, and then I just tore it in half. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's move towards the shoreline here then. Uh, I love the way you did the water here as it kind of comes into the sand. Yeah, thanks. So we did. We tried to take that throughout the, the whole mock and, and add the transition, like you said, you know, the water kind of getting lighter. And, and then floating the water throughout was really fun to do. There's no supports under under there so it makes it a little nerve-wracking to travel with but you know it looks pretty cool and you can do more plant work under the water so and then as we get to the beach what do we have happening here just a ton of storylines so i mean you know lego's all about the story right so um i work for them on and off throughout the year and i uh so i try and keep with that so over where he's filming now we've got uh it's just, you know, a pirate party. There's like a fish fry going on, and we've also got the pirates bringing in their uh, their haul out of the water there. And then, you know, there's probably not a lot of kid pirates in the world, but we've got a, a child pirate uh, burying a buddy and building sandcastles. And then, you know, the, the CMF uh, turtle. If you got a beach scene, you got to get turtles in there. So we've got some hatching there and crawling their way to the ocean. That's so neat. I love that. Thanks. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, using the dinosaur eggs hatching open, uh, I might be taking some liberties, but I think we get the idea. And then here we've got some nice vegetation behind that. Yeah, so again, my wife and her, her plant work is really next level. I wish I could do that. My brain doesn't work that way, but... We tried to use the vegetation all throughout to, you know, again, hide story details. So, you know, the monkeys that are up to no good, they're kind of collecting their loot in there. And then they don't know it, but there's a panther behind a rock and vegetation and he's hungry. So we'll see how that goes. And then, of course, the pirate running away. If I fell a tree and there was a panther, I'd probably be running, too. What's happening in the cage here? Yeah, so I mean, uh, there's there's another child pirate poking the uh, <laughs> the blue coat in the back of the head and trying to make sure he doesn't get too comfortable uh, on this vacation, so to speak. And uh, one one of the details I really liked up up on the shoreline is the the cannon making it look like the cannon has smoothed out the sand by doing the greebling right up to it, and then the pirates uh, putting it in place for protection. Yeah, so it's like they pulled it ashore there. Yeah, that was the idea. You know, whether anybody else sees it that way, that's how my brain sees it. <laughs> no, I can totally see it. It's those little details that, like that that really make the build. And even if maybe most people don't notice them, you know it's there. Yeah, I know. I Yeah, I really I really enjoy the hidden things I put in there that, that nobody will ever notice. Um, they just go by too quick, aren't looking for details. Um, like Cody, right? We've got the the convention, one of the convention owners in there as his pirate minifig building Lego. Um, so it looks it looks a little out of place, but that's one of those details that you know means something to the people who know. You know? He's just surround surrounded by pieces there. That's great. Yeah, I mean that that's how his Lego room looks too. <laughs> a, a couple thousand more bricks than that, but that's the Lego room. 
And then we start to get some elevation towards the back of the build. Yeah, I tried to, um, it's always good when you can raise it, right? I, I don't have enough brake to raise it without using slope, but uh, it really separates the scenes, right? So you can kind of see different things going on. Um, we've got uh, the cook up there that's uh, getting all the pirate uh, dinner ready. Uh, monkey, lots of monkeys getting into mischief here. That one's stealing some food, and then uh, the chef's caught him, but just up above the chef is another monkey throwing a, a pineapple at the chef. So, you know, trying to help his buddy get some loot back. <laughs> it's a strategic effort from the monkeys. Yeah, yeah, they're, they've got to coordinate. I mean, that's how they got all the, the loot before the panther gets them. <laughs> I love the use of the wooden pieces for tables. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that Those are too delicate. <laughs> they're constantly falling, um, but it, it turned out pretty good. I think if I were to have more time before the con, I would have, you know, made it so I could s stick plates down and, and things like that. Uh, but, you know, they're pirates. They don't need plates or napkins or any of that. They just use their hands. <laughs> and then what's at the very top of the hill? Is that the pirate captain? Yeah, so it goes up It goes up into the captain's quarters, so to speak. And there's really fun details in there as well. Uh, if you look on the pirate's nightstand there, <laughs> we actually have... A photo of Susan from Lego Masters Season 2, that scene where she's biting the brick and spitting it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call her out. That's a photo of her on the nights, the captain's It's, it's night. become a meme now. You've got to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got T-shirts. You know, once, once it's a T-shirt, you know, you've made it for sure. <laughs> yeah, so many fun details here. Another thing I love is that you actually, did you brick build a lot of, or a lot of these trees here? Yep, so all of the trees uh, are brick built. We've used the, the trees in the back that use the brown cheese slope in the past. And uh, yeah, the banana trees, there. They're, they're fun. They're super fragile. I have to take those all down when I travel. But all the other ones kind of follow the Barracuda Bay build. Basically, I just multiplied by a lot. There's a lot of trees in here. And uh we even use Kakamora, uh, the coconut pirates from Moana, in, in the trees. So, you know, if the kids look closely, they'll, they'll see those up in there. And then at the very back of the build, we've got a nice water feature with some movement uh, going down at the bottom of the waterfall. Yeah, this is kind of the last piece of movement. And the, the moving waterfall was probably not overly hard, I, I guess, compared to just the the greebling of the water to make it look like it's it's got that flow. It, it took me a surprisingly long time to, to do that and less to do just the, you know, the belt with the, the water falling on it. But I like the way that the splashing water turned out at the bottom and just kind of had this, this hidden grotto over here because I didn't want the Disney themes down here to take away from the rest of the mock. So we tried to make it, you know, secluded and have the Lost Boys, you know, coveting the pirates loot up here and um still something for kids and people to pick out though yeah exactly those those little teeny things you know no, most people aren't going to notice that pig drinking from the the water but you know the right kid's going to notice it get home be like oh what do you mean brother you didn't see that i saw that <laughs> and so. then even along the side you've got details here as well yeah so what we decided to do along the front and like this is like classic pirate people are going to get it um but these are actually not my creations these are the skulls that have been in classic lego sets uh pirate sets over the years so this uh these two on the end are both from the um the three-in-one creator pirate set with the roller coaster and then these ones down here are kind of the the old school ones and uh just tried to give that nod to you know the classics what so many of the people around our age, this is what got them, right? Pirates or, uh, or city, right? And now they're, uh, yeah, now we're paying homage, right? So. No, I love that. It's a great kind of throwback thing, and that's something for the adults then to get as well. So the whole build is fantastic. What was bringing this to the show like? What, how did you get this all set up? Uh, slowly. So normally when I take bigger mocks like this, it doesn't take quite as much setup. I found that... Having the gears certainly adds a lot of complication. Building so you can change the batteries out and then building small enough to box it up without needing help and things like that. The other struggle is when you know when you have foliage that's this dense, it's 
easy to build it in place, but once you have to move it, the leaves catch on each other and you spend hours going back and fixing the plants that fell along the, the plate lines, right? So that was probably the, the hardest part. And then just babysitting it all day, right? Making sure the batteries are changed and that a gear hasn't slipped and then just hanging out and talking with AFOLs, right? Right. No, that's super fun part of it. And I do have to point out, you know, we've had we've had a bit of an incident behind the weapons catch Ooh. over here as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's some bad things are happening. But it's a pirate island, so it can't all be, you know, kids burying their buddy in the sand. Um uh, my wife actually a couple years ago I built a lighthouse and I wanted to have a, a shark that had taken away an individual so she talked me out of it so this year we have a shark that has torn the legs off of a pirate in the water and then yeah as she points out there's a murder up uh, up on the sand there yeah so many fun elements here I'm sure this is fun for you to set up with just all the different scenes and everything going on in there and I what I'm sure the public has had a great reaction what have people said as they've walked up to this I, I mean I think really it's about the detail everybody comments on the detail the the greebling in the sand was kind of a, if I had time thing, right? The con rapidly approaches, if I have time, I will do that level of greebling. And then it just became, it has to have it, right? So between the, the greebling, the detail in the plants, you know, how many trees there are. And then the, the detail in the stories, like I said, right? You want to have like a couple stories on every base plate for people to find, um, that, that's the fun part. That's the part I love is, is the creating the, the tale, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. That's, that's the creative fun part of LEGO. So thank you so much for bringing this all out to the show. For all your effort here, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Hi, I'm uh, Ezra from Ezra, Ezra Builds LEGO, and this is the Atalanta. Um, she is my pandemic child. Um, <laughs> I already had two of the regular ones, so I figured this was a better use of nine months. Um, she's a diesel punk flying pirate ship of my own design based off my own artwork and uh, it was kind of like my dream project I always wanted to build a pirate ship I never had a pirate ship set as a kid and I figured the only thing cooler than a pirate ship is a flying one so I did a little bit of research um, on ship construction rigging and a little bit of design Took some uh, key influences from like uh, Warhammer 40K, Treasure Planet was a big one, a little bit of Space Battleship Yamato, and then definitely my own like aesthetic input um, to create something that I, I hope is unique and stands out on her own. Um, but the overall result was a 208 centimeter uh, flying pirate ship, complete interior, LED lights, Technic play functions, uh, viewable doors. She has a removable mizzen mast section right here for viewing the interior. So this section comes out, has sliding doors, and then inside you can view crew quarters, part of the mess and galley. Um, but the entire ship has a fully fleshed out interior, including the aft castle. The captain's wheel actually drives the ship rudder. Um, it's a little slow, 66% of the time it works every time, but it works. There's a lot of deflection. There you go. Nice. That was one of the hardest things to engineer on this ship was the working rudder. Um, as a firing mortar, it has working cargo ramp, uh, the cargo crane for the uh, ship works as well. Uh, anchors in the front, lower and raise. Mm, what else? Just tons of details. Tons of de details and play features. I had, I had a lot of fun fleshing everything out and doing the rigging and all that other good stuff. When you started on this project, did you plan for it to be this large all along, or did you kind of grow as you added more elements to it? My goal was about five feet, and as I started to shape the hull, um, I found that in order to get the kind of contours and lines that I wanted based off my artwork that it had to grow a little bit so the end result was 82 inches which I think is a little over six feet okay. yeah. I mean it's certainly very imposing here so talk about uh, if you can kind of the sails and more of that rigging section there because you've got all of this uh, you know rope in there and the lines to kind of keep it all together 
So the rigging is mostly cosmetic. Um, the idea behind the rigging and the sails was that, so the sails are actually full length, and when my lazy behind gets around to it, um, I'm going to put some rivets in the sails and set them up so that they can actually furl and unfurl because if you look closely at the yard arms, I put uh, pulley lines in here so that all the sails can actually be rolled and unrolled once I get around to putting rivets in them. Um, I took some time, uh, I'm an army veteran so I don't know that much about ships, so I had to look up all this navy type stuff on how to tie ropes and knots, but I tried to make them as accurate as possible. I took some liberties, of course, because ships don't fly. Um, but the end result I think I'm pretty happy with was rigging that looks relatively realistic. And once I finally get around to it, hopefully we'll have some sails that can go up and down and look pretty cool as well. Yeah, I mean, even in this style, it looks fantastic here. Another thing you mentioned was all the interior. So talk about kind of some of those details that you can see inside there and what kind of scenes and minifigures you were able to include. So she has roughly a 40 plus minifigure crew with a few hidden Lego masters on board. Um, in the front, starting at the bottom is the cargo hold. And that's actually a multi-level cargo hold with the ramp that goes up to the middle. It's viewable from this area right here. And then these doors lower into the same cargo area. Um, behind that, and it's continuous. So if you could actually get a camera in there, you can see all the way through the ship. Um, but in here we have the galley, and that's my wife, Sigfig. Um, <laughs> she's with the food, of course. And then behind the galley we have engineering. And engineering has the um, ether boilers, which keep the ship up in the air. And then the lower deck has the treasure hold, which is below the crew compartment, or uh, cargo compartment down there. And then down here we have sort of some storage areas that are not easily viewable because of ship construction. And then below that we have a brig. Um, the gondola is a removable section for play and accessibility as well. Um, the next deck up has the upper areas of um, the forward gun rooms, the cargo area, the mess for the crew. Um, they're viewable in from the top. And then the stairwell goes all the way down to the bottom deck, and that's viewable from right here. Let me get this guy out of there for you. You can get a little case of vertigo looking down there. <laughs> no, that's fantastic, though, to just have so many details that you were able to include in here. So talk a little bit about the armaments of a flying ship like this. What, what were you able to include? So as far as her armaments go, she has four, I believe it's four um, defense guns. There's a top deck one, the what I call the suicide gun, the gondola turret, and then the tail gunner, like the Iron Maiden song. Um, <laughs> and those are for defense of the ship. And then she has her broadsides uh, for chasing down other ships, as well as her bow chasers, which are hidden behind a pair of doors up in the front. Um, she also has smoke grenade launchers, or what they would call cloud canisters, and a battering ram. And that pretty much rounds out her armament, as well as an assortment of crew. We've got a sniper up here, um, all the way on the top of the mizzen mast. And then we have just a miscellaneous amount of boarding crew and what have you. Um, the captain is the lioness. She's at the helm. And that's my own character. Very nice. One of the things that really kind of brings this build to life also is the, the vehicles you've kind of attached around it here. So what are some of these other kind of flying vehicles you have? So I call these Sky Coursers. They're essentially flying motorcycles. Um, this is the Captain's. It's, um, I think I called it a Camara. It's loosely based on the Ferrari 250 GTO, uh, especially with the red and the, the swell designs and stuff like that. Um, and then I have several others that are circling around the ship. Um, there's a black one that I wanted to have kind of like a very Harley style to it. There's a green one down there. The blue one hanging from the cradle on the bottom of the ship. Um, there's a very small one over there off the stand that has my son's minifig hanging off of it like an Ewok. That stole a speeder bike. <laughs> um, a little tribute to the Mandalorian one up on the front by the Airsick Unikitty. 
Um, I modified it into one of my Sky Coursers. And then just a few others kind of circling around. Um, they were sort of my idea. Uh, you know, everybody loves speeder bikes from Star Wars, right? So I wanted to incorporate something very similar in my in my world. Um, but since my world is very analog, very diesel, I thought what better than to have a propeller-driven engine attached to a seat and have someone just hang on through the air. <laughs> oh, perfect. I love it. And we've talked about the size of this, something like six feet long. Uh, do you know how many parts are in it in total? Have you been able to keep track? I didn't even bother to count, but based on BrickLink orders, I would guess at about 60,000. Yeah. A lot of gray in there. <laughs> uh, yeah. A lot of dark gray, dark bluish gray. A lot of it. <laughs> a lot of gold, a lot of dark red, a lot of broken dark red went into the process, too. <laughs> You had to use everything, you know? Yeah, you really did. Um, I spent a lot of time. I took nine months total, so there was a lot of downtime waiting for parts after I broke something, waiting for something else. Um, and then a lot of sourcing strange stuff. Because, um, you know, I had a 25-year dark age before I built this, and I had only been building for a month or two when I started this project. So a lot of what I have, I didn't know what it was. And I was like, this is cool. I can use this. And just went with it. A lot of the arm pieces that are here in the, the wing frames are Technic stuff I'd never seen before. There's some, some mounting pieces down here in the bottom and also in the forward arms that I don't know what they're from. Couldn't tell you, but I love them. So what was transport and setup at the show like for this large build? Um, setup takes about 45 minutes and honestly, most of setup is untangling the rigging. <laughs> um, because at, this is our fourth show. So we've actually gotten into a pretty good groove with the whole thing. Um, once we pull her out of the car, we bring her in on a dolly, drop the stand, set her on the stand, and then just start putting everything together. My wife adds the crew while I untangle the rigging and she attaches the engines, um, and distracts the children. <laughs> There you go. I love it. Sounds like a good plan. Well, this is a fantastic build. Thanks so much for all the work you put into building as well as bringing it out to the show here. It's so impressive and really representing this kind of like steampunk, diesel punk type of genre that doesn't always have a lot of builds in most conventions. So I love to see a theme like this. It's absolutely hands down my favorite theme is diesel punk and the Atalanta is, you know, my pet project. So it's, it's really been a lot of fun to come out and help represent with steampunk and diesel punk. Perfect. Well, keep up the good work. Thanks, man. My name is Marcellus Brown, and this is my ship, the Wittigalley. Uh, it was captained by Black Sam Bellamy. He was uh, one of the, you could say, pirate lords of the golden age of piracy. And he became one of the richest until his main flagship uh, crashed on off of Cape Cod, and uh, no one was left alive. You could say their greed caught up with them. Yeah. So take us through this beautiful creation that you have here then, because there's so much to take in. Uh, where did you start with this build? Um, I had to start way down at the base, because transporting this thing was definitely one of the priorities, if I was ever going to move it anywhere, you know? So I made the base plate, uh, base plate being the major build of the bottom, uh, super rigid and like stacked with so many Lego plates it was kind of ridiculous yeah so then from there it just started to grow upwards so then it was uh up on the sides then it was the forecastle and eventually the masts came up and everything came into place so talk about the masts and sails then what you used to achieve that um i actually just stopped by joanne's and uh grabbed a yard of some just standard fabric stuff that looked uh heavy as uh, actual real thick canvas and uh, light enough for my Lego pieces to not bend under the weight. It works really well. So what are some of the details then that you have on the, the top deck? Uh, you've got cannons, what else is going on there? Um, so when the crew of the of Black Sam Bellamy found the Witta, or uh, found being they stole it from other people, uh, they they found uh, tons of treasure under the hold, like ginormous piles. He became the richest pirate, like ever, 
in just one day. It was crazy. Uh, so I've got the treasure chest there to show off the, you know, massive amount of loot they gained. Um, I also wanted to show, you know, in battle. So I added cannon fire and crazy amounts of explosions happening around the side. There's a pirate there uh, evading uh, a deserter trying to run away with all the rum. Now, one thing that's cool about this ship is it actually has some of an, an interior underneath the main deck, right? It does. I can totally open that up for yeah. you right now. It just takes a while because all the cannons and such tend to, you know, clutter up the deck, <laughs> honestly. But you can see once, as you, as you take off the cannons, then it starts to open it all up? Yeah, so once all the cannons are off, it becomes definitely a transformation between the main deck and below decks. Here we go. And that all comes apart and you can look inside. Now one of the main things when uh, making the interior was to have lots of like little cannons in there. Because when they discovered the Witta, they being the archaeologists finding the wreck of the Witta, they found nearly like a hundred cannons inside, or if not a hundred, a lot. Um, and that was because when they looted the Witta, they being the pirates, they had to use cannons uh, in order to have enough displacement under the water to keep the ship afloat. So they needed all those cannons at the bottom to try and, you know, not sink, basically. There's also another area back here uh, that basically just shows the brig. Just gotta reach around all the rigging. Yeah, it's the rigging's not even done yet. It's it's about half complete. I'm hoping by next year all the rigging will be uh, placed up and it will be restored to its full glory. <laughs> but yeah, down there is the brig with a couple of dead Imperial soldiers, because that's all they're good for. <laughs> I love the story you've created with this. So the rigging that you do have done so far, talk about how you kind of achieved that because there's a lot going on with this build. Yeah, so the rigging was done probably a week before I came here, which is why it's not done. Um, I have this instruction manual from a plastic model kit I had. And since the model plans were very similar to the ship I was trying to build, I used those same plans to try and plan out where all the rigging would go. So I used uh, slip knots everywhere and eventually I got to a point where I got exactly the build I wanted. Uh, so then it was on to the rat lines and such, but those didn't get completed because since I needed to finish the dead eyes, the dead eyes at the bottom were super hard because trying to fit a needle through all those like tiny little spokes of wheels was really hard. <laughs> I imagine, but it looks fantastic there, and you've even got all of this kind of gold decorative stuff on the front as well. Yeah, so that was just uh, tubes, Lego tubes that are just threaded through with these uh, golden cones, and it's a very simple process, but it pays off in a big way. I also did it in the back there uh, on the stern uh, just to show and highlight that uh, the stern. <laughs> No, yeah, why not add more decoration? Yeah. So when this travels to a show, does it travel, the whole ship travel as one piece? Yeah, the whole ship is thick and the base plate is strong enough that the whole thing can just be lifted off and taken to wherever it needs to go. Uh, there is a lot of things you have to do with the rigging and such since that's always a nightmare. Uh, trying to deconstruct in certain places where it won't tangle up. And of course it still gets tangled up, but yeah, it's, that's basically the entire process. And then coming here, it was just a matter of rebuilding where all the rigging should go and such. You've even brick built the flags all around here as well, which is yeah. very impressive. That was one of the things I had to do. It was one of the things I envisioned like right from the start, I had to brick build my flags. And I had to do it in such a way that it would give the energy of my pirate ship. 
basically transforming this not only into a historical build, but also a emotional and hardened build of pirates. And yeah, that was pretty much it. Yeah. No, it looks fantastic. Do you know how many pieces are in the whole build overall? Gosh, if I had to guess, I'd say nearly over 2,000, uh, probably 20,000. I have no idea because everything on front is probably doubled by everything underneath and then doubled by everything below it. So it's who knows at this point. <laughs> it adds up quickly, but the, the whole build is very impressive here. Uh, all of the details that you were able to include as well as the whole story for it. It looks really impressive on display, so thank you so much for chatting with me. Yeah, of course. Thank you for interviewing. This is one of my passions, and it's amazing to be recognized. <laughs> awesome. Keep up the good work. Gerard Houston, I started with the ship. It's not my idea to do the rocking, but I think it was a really good idea, so I just stole it. The port itself, it took a, about a couple months to build. They started with each building slowly. They built the ground up. The buildings, they all come off, and the port takes apart, so it packs up really nicely. All the minifigs and all the detailing is I added on afterwards. Just working on it throughout the con. Yeah, that's very impressive. When you first started this build, it's obviously a pretty large layout here. Did you have kind of a plan of how it was all going to be laid out, or did that kind of come together as you built? Well, I made a rough layout when I first started. There were some things I needed I knew I wanted to do, so I kind of just worked around that and went from there. Okay. And talk about this ship a little more, because it's up. Really great build here. Is this all custom in the sails and stuff, or are those sails from an official LEGO set? The sails are from a Pirates of the Caribbean set, the Queen Anne's Revenge, but the rest of it's all custom, my own design. And how, how is the movement being achieved there? Uh, there's a technic thing at the bottom that pushes it up and down slowly. There's a motor that just turns it. Very cool. And then if you want to take us through some of the buildings over here and maybe some of the techniques that were used in these, some, some of your favorite of the buildings in the town here. This building is definitely my favorite. I've had it for actually quite a while. I really like how I inset the inside of the walls here to really make the black timber walls come out. There's a partial interior on the inside. It's the only one that actually has an interior, except for the one over there, I guess. And then you've also used the, the kind of brick face bricks here as well for this building. Yeah, I wish I'd gotten more because I didn't have enough for the top, but I did have enough for the most of it. The green building at back is also another one of my favorites. It turned out really nicely. That's a great, the, that sand green color is always great for that kind of building. Yeah, it's really good for this time period. It, it looks really nice. And I like where you, you always got kind of the castle fort built in the back there. Yeah, it's not quite as tall as I wanted because it can't really shoot over the buildings, but whatever. <laughs> it works. How long does it take you to set up this whole display generally? It, it took a few hours to do it but not as bad as I expected, though. Yeah, well, that's that's very impressive here. Is this a theme that you've built in a lot in the past, like pirates, this type of thing, or is the first time you've tried this type of layout? Oh, I've been building pirates for years, but this is definitely my biggest one I've ever done. So plans to expand on this in the future, then? You want to make it bigger for future brick cons? Uh, probably not. I might just break it all down and start anew, <laughs> but we'll see. There you go, yeah. Well, I think this one turned out great, so thanks for talking to me about it. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem.
Hey everybody, my name is Grant Davis. Here I have a Lego Pirate Creation. This is actually a collaborative build with Eli Wilsey, so the split is right on the other side of the volcano there. We've been working on this for approximately two weeks. I put as much time as I possibly could into this. Got very, very little sleep. Uh, look at this over here. Look at this. There's people constantly putting junk on my build. These two rascals back here, man. Got a few pirate minifigs, got a little temple Aztec thing in there. Got some nice function in here, the spinning, spinning wheel of some sort. We got a bunch of little greebles and stuff going on over here. It's a really intricate design, a bunch of random parts I used. We got a bunch of bionic or binoculars and bananas and different things in there. The rock work is pretty fun. The it's rock not. work is spectacular. I think that looks really good. Yeah, we got a, a lot of nice stud in mixture there, not the usual brick belt stuff. This is, I believe, four by seven base plates, and we just simply have a nice, nice removable sections here. You just take off that guy. They're all completely removable. Very convenient. Even back in the mountain there, like this, there's a seam right here all the way up. There's another seam right there. The best seam for visibility is right over there. Got a volcano up top here. Got some cool trees over here. We got nice watches. These are old watch band pieces. I bought them in brown for bridges over there. That's a neat technique. I like that, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. We got sort of Ewok-esque design. Nice, nice straight up, straight up spiral staircase type thing going on. What's the inspiration for this build? Is there anything in particular that inspired you to make like an island type build like this? No, I've always really, really liked tropical areas. I've lived in the Northwest my whole life, fir trees everywhere. Whenever I go down to a more tropical area, I get a lot more enjoyment out of looking at the scenery. So I've always liked doing palm trees and big cool flowers and stuff. Uh, the inspiration for this was really just out of my head. I always like doing pirates. It seems like the best thing. Sort of Indiana Jonesy, sort of Pirates of the Caribbean-ish. A bunch of bunch of different inspirations. A bunch of different builders I like following and uh, redo some of their techniques and stuff. It's along with my own a bit. And can you talk about down here the waterfall, which I think is really cool, and what the, what technique you've got going on there? Yeah, so the waterfall is sort of like one of the old music boxes. There's a tread inside with pins that rotate around at about like a five second interval. And then there's a bunch of little flaps that get pushed out by those pins and the rubber band that takes them back in. Very cool. Yeah, so you get kind of that motion look there. Yeah. I think that's, that's really neat. So the goal with that was to make it visible and completely look normal, even if the function broke like it's prone to do at conventions. So if all the flaps are down and the rubber bands are in and the, the tread in the back isn't working at all, it still looks like a normal waterfall. Yeah. Really awesome. What's the hardest part of putting together a big display like this for you? The hardest part was probably working with my collaborator, making sure the line in the center was all the same. But probably for my own part, the rock work. It takes forever to do it like I like it. Uh, so many different snot bricks I'm using and different angles to get, to get it to look right. Really cool. I think it turned out great, so good job. Yeah, thank you so much. My name is Ray Morton and this is my pirate ship, the Minotaurus. It is a uh, power functions rocking pirate ship. Okay. Wow, that's really cool. So what gave you the idea to build something like this? Actually, I was looking at the instructions for the Imperial flagship and I noticed they had holes in the bottom and I thought I should be able to put some kind of mechanism inside the boat to make it rock that no one would be able to see. Uh, so I actually built it and I had Technic uh, shafts 
going through those holes and it caused huge problems and it failed miserably. So this is a new and improved version where I actually use uh, Technic beams to do all the action and it's highly reliable. Uh, I haven't had to do any uh, maintenance besides changing the batteries. Okay, that's, that's really cool. So is this kind of showing what's, what's going on in there? This is exactly what's happening inside this boat. Um, and the key point with this is it's got a pivot point on the back. So if you find the sweet spot on the boat, you can balance it on this, and then this has to do very little work. Yeah, that's awesome. And so then, uh, what, what, how was building kind of the, the, the rest of the structure of the ship, I guess the non-technical part, did you enjoy that, or do you enjoy more of the, the moving technical part of the build? I enjoy it all. Okay. Um, once I had that figured out, it's just a matter of replicating it over and over, but figuring out how to actually build the rest of the ship, and then doing the fine tuning afterwards was fun too. Okay. Well, th this is a, a really great build, and I love the way you've set it all up. You know, multiple levels of cannons and everything there, lots of great detail, and then rocking back and forth. Is this an idea you're kind of planning to expand on in the future, maybe more ships like this or something like that? Well, I currently have two going. I have the, uh, the Imperial flagship that is motorized, and I'll put that together with this so they're fighting each other. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do any more ships like this. I've got the idea out there, and I'm, I invite anybody to steal it and, and go with it and make full ship scape battles <laughs> with rocking and whatnot go crazy i don't mind i don't know if i'm going to do any more myself it's hard to say mm -hmm. to close this out here if you had to do this build again uh, is there any design thing or structural thing building thing that you wish you would have done differently or that you wish you would have known before setting out to build this well if i knew how to do it in the first place it would be so much quicker <laughs> well, well we can all wish we can all hope um well I'm a mechanical guy and I'm really struggling to get my detail to be better and better. Uh, okay. So the, if I do another pirate ship, I'm going to spend more time on the detail and of course I don't have to spend any time on the mechanics. You got the mechanics down. Exactly. Yeah, very cool. Very impressive. Thanks for talking to us about it. Yeah. Appreciate it. I'm David Tapia. This is the Green Mermaid. My daughter named it. <laughs> uh, we actually didn't have a mermaid on it until just the other day. But it does come apart. It's fully modular. We got in here, we got the captain's cabin. Doing a little bit of navigation, making sure they're going in the right direction. Down here we have the officer's area. A little guy napping. That was a last minute build, so it's not perfect. <laughs> um, got a dog chasing the cat around. I love the tiled floors in there, though. That's that nice kind of fancy detail to it. Yeah, that was a last-minute throw-in. I had extra tiles. Wanted to do that. Um, this pops out here. We've got some storage area. Little locked-up chain gate. Make sure nobody steals anything. Keep them honest. The galley and mess area. Making some fish stew. Yesterday was pickled pork. These sections here do pop off. So you can see the cannons underneath. And under here, under the boat cover, there's one of those little rowboats. Yeah. And all the sails are custom, and based off of Lego templates. Also for the hammocks, those are based off of one from the Friends line. Yeah, that's incredible. So much detail in there. So is this uh, design based off of any particular real ships or just kind of something you came up with in your head? No, just kind of because it's something I came up with in my head. I always wanted a ship as a kid. And then now that I'm an adult, I want to build it so that my kids can play with it. There's access for the minifigures everywhere in there. Um, and I like how it comes apart. It's fairly sturdy. There are just little bits and pieces that need to be tacked back on every once in a while. Talk about kind of the design process with this, because obviously a ship has a lot of interesting angles that uh, is always, isn't always easy to achieve with LEGO, so how did that come together for you? Um, I knew I wanted to do a double-decker that came apart. Uh, I started off with like one hull piece shorter. Uh, originally, there were guns on the bottom and on the top. 
figured that wouldn't really work with the water line and everything, so I moved them up to the top. Um, it took, overall, it took about a year for the whole design process, um, but this most recent rebuild was about eight hours spread over three days, so a lot of work in there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What would you say is the, the hardest part of achieving this design for you? Um, I would, like you said, the angled areas up here in the front. We got the Lego hall piece, getting that to work with double layers. I'm still not happy with it, but it's a work in progress anyways. <laughs> and then back here for the curved hall pieces, or sorry, the curved areas, uh, just getting the angles right with these bricks here um, and making sure everything fits. Some of it is illegal, some of it's legal. It works. <laughs> yeah, it all fits together in yeah. the end. <laughs> well, that's so impressive. So do you plan to expand on maybe a larger fleet in the future or more ships? Oh, it, this is the one that I brought with me. There are more at home okay. in boxes and stuff. But, yeah, we'll probably expand a little bit more. Yeah. There you go. Well, thank you so much for taking us through the whole build here. There's so much fun details to look at, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for coming out. I'm Daniel Konstansky, and this is now uh, moving on from the ships. This is my pirate set display kind of other than ships. So. Basically, the way it worked, it started in 1989, and there's always been a mix of, again, they always pair the good guy and the bad guy with something big and something small, usually. And oftentimes, a big and a small for, this, for the good guys and the bad guys um, in each wave. So we started off, this was Forbidden Island. This was the original Pirate Island, and it was paired with the El Dorado Fortress, which was the original Blue Coat base. And then you had some of the Lagoon lockups in Sabre Island, just the stuff the you know, back then there were so many more little sets that people could get with their pocket money. They kind of, you know, this is just such a great example of what LEGO used to do where it's, it's a great little standalone set, right? It works all by itself, but when you pair it with that, it just becomes even more so, which is awesome. And then something um, I noticed here, this is an oh interesting, yeah. talk about what, what this is here because it's not something you see typically. So back in the day, um, there were a few things like this where LEGO would release, and this, this was somewhat unique to Pirates. Uh, so they released this storyline to go with it, and so it featured the original two ships and then the, uh, basically all the original sets from that first wave, and it had named characters, which was really rare for back then. Um, and you got a couple of those named characters with the, I mean, they were very, cl very rough approximations, <laughs> like this is supposed to be that little kid. Um, but uh, so this is just kind of a cool piece of vintage pirate history um, where it's, you can. It's almost like a forerunner of the books today where they include yeah. the minifig in them, that sort yeah, of thing. It really is. It really is very similar to that. And it was just kind of a way to introduce and give a narrative to the, the sets at the, of the time. Um, that's pretty cool. So just moving on then, this was uh, Shipwreck Island. Uh, this was the later uh, Pirate Island, which I must confess its name is escaping me at the moment. Uh, Rock Island Refuge is what I think it was. Um, so obviously you can see it just it got bigger. This went to that, and this went to that. So it was kind of following that similar pattern of the ships of, all right, first we're going to try to go bigger. Um, so that's the Imperial Trading Post in the back there with the, with the two full 32 by 32 base plates, one of which was um, 3D base plates. You can just kind of say, one 3D base plate, okay, we'll do that, plus another base plate. And that's such a great set. You look at that set oh, there. Yeah. I mean, not only is it, like you said, the big base plate, but then you've got like a whole bay there all yeah. in one set. I mean, that's yep. that's amazing. And it's got, and you've got the, the kind of port and dock areas around. You could pull the big ships up to it on the outside, and then the little one that came with it could sail through it. And then this is a really unique piece of LEGO history. The Islanders theme um, came out in the mid-90s, and it was just a one-of, uh, only included, I think it was six sets. Um, of which we have five of them here. And the big one was uh, Enchanted Island. It was kind of this lagoon, half a lagoon with the, again, 3D base plate paired with the, um, Lego just made them big in the mid 90s, I guess, when it comes to base plates. So, and the Islanders have never been rebooted, which just blows my mind. They was, it was such a great theme. It really was. Yeah. I mean, you look at this, this uh, ship design here on the canoes yeah, and the everything. Yeah, yeah, that's so great. And it was just such a great infusion into the pirate theme because, you know, up to that point, it had all been good guy versus bad guy. It just kind of gave a third party, if you will, um, you know, to, to raid or to fight the pirates or to whatever. Featured all the cool statues, you know, with this. And, uh, and then, like, on this one here, it, um, it actually opens up, and so the idea was you could, you know, sail through and find the hidden lagoon and all of that. King's Throne, Crocodile Okay, So again, just like good little set design that by itself is fun, gave you a little taste of the theme, but also could be paired with the bigger stuff. Um, and then that was uh, uh, Skull Island, obviously. <laughs> Lego was into swinging things that opened into caves at that point in time. So again, getting smaller. That one came a few years before the kind of rough pirate ships that kind of ended the theme there in the mid-90s for a while. 
And this was the last gasp. So this was the last big pirate island um, that came out and paired with the, uh, the Spanish Armada. So kind of shipwrecks were the theme that year. They had two different sets that were shipwrecks. And it, what you can really see about that set is it's largely empty. It's just kind of, they're really relying on the base plate to give it half. <laughs> There's like a couple plants, and oh, we'll call yeah, the day. Yeah, call, it, call it good. Call it good. Not, now, not a very good model. Is that rock there? Does that design yeah, to come down? I don't think I've seen that before. Down, but it's terrible. Like it just, I did, okay, just <laughs> it just kind of is there. And, it, and, it, and the funny thing is, if you put a minifigure there, it goes right over his head. Like it doesn't even hurt him. <laughs> it's the second guy in line who gets it. So. And then, uh, and then this I just kind of threw together for fun here. So this is just kind of a sampling of the minifigures throughout the years. And it's just kind of interesting to see, on the one hand, how they've advanced. And on the other hand, they were already pretty detailed to begin with. Like, the, the differences are subtle as opposed to, to really major. Kind of your own so. custom collectible minifig line yeah, here at yeah, Pirates. Yeah. I have a few of those 4x3 uh, base plates lying around. So. I love the the chrome armor piece there, yeah, the chrome, like breastplate unique, piece. That was unique to the Spanish Armada. So it was just that one guy. He had a name. I don't remember what it was at this point, but uh, but yeah. So he had the the chrome armor, and then you got the the Islanders and everything. Otherwise, the pirates have been pretty unchanged the whole time. Right. But. Same basic type of wear. So yeah. do you have a favorite set out of all of these then? Uh, about all of these, I think it would be Enchanted Island. That was just one I just had so much fun with as a kid. So it was just, it was a perfect age. I was nine, nine years old when I got that one. So kind of right there in the thick of it. Yes. So. <laughs> the golden age there for That's the Lego. Right. That's right. <laughs> At least for me anyway with, uh, with the collecting. So. Yeah, well, they're all great sets. I think, you know, you lay these out like this, and it's obvious why Pirates kind of has so much appeal even today yeah. and why those sets are still so popular. Yep, yep, a lot of appeal. And then obviously pure nostalgia for those of us old enough to remember when those were out and wanting them. So, yeah, a great theme. I really wish, wish, wish it would be more popular now, but probably not going to happen. They have tried twice to reboot it and add a movie tie-in, and if none of that has worked, it's probably not going to work any, any time in the near future, unfortunately. At some point, you just give up. Now, I noticed you mentioned the 3D base plates uh, several times. Talk about a little bit more of that, because that really hasn't been something they've done in a while. Yeah, so, so and you can, To be honest, you can kind of begin to see why with these sets, right? Like, you look at the, 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 um, the Imperial Trading Post there. Fantastic set, right? So much playability. But when you get right down to it, there's not that many pieces on there. They had to give so much of the plastic away to the 3D base plate. And at the end of the day, it's cool, but it doesn't necessarily add that much to it that for the trade-off. So, but yeah, so LEGO was really into them in the late 80s and early 90s. And you can even see how they began to peter out and kind of become smaller, and then they just kind of vanished. I forget when the last one was. It was probably early 2000s. I think some of the, the uh, Knight's Kingdom castles had them, and that was about it. So... Yeah, you're right, though. You look at any of these sets that where, that where they build on that base plane, it just seems very spare, it's sparse very like sparse. this and everything. It's, it's almost like they wanted people to like just build on top of that, and we'll just kind of let you have at it. Yeah, and they were actually really awkward to build on top of because the problem with them is that there's got to be a way to support the plastic on top. Like, there can't be too much of a space that doesn't have something that goes down to the floor. So, like, that's why the ramp and pit base plate, they made use of the pit, but the pit is really there to keep it from bending and breaking. And these other ones that are kind of the half lagoon, they had to keep it so narrow and kind of weird that it's just not easy to build on in any way. So even Lego didn't. They just kind of <laughs> built on the end of it where it was easy and then kind of threw a little half, uh, half shelter there for good measure. But where, where the ones that are on the flat, they're so much more visually interesting and more bulky because uh, they had all the parts to a lot to that. So, And Channon Island, I feel, is one of the main exceptions to that. They're the 3D base, but it did really kind of add to it with the bridge and the little structure off of it. Like That, that felt sort of like a natural good, outcropping almost yeah, off of it. Yeah, exactly. Kind of the idea of like kind of building it into whatever trees and foliage and rock was there. Where some of the other ones, especially the last big pirate island there, as you said, it just kind of feels ignored. <laughs> Exactly. Well, this is great. I appreciate you bringing all these out and kind of exploring the Pirates history here at Philly Brickfest. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. It was fun. I'm Daniel Konstansky, and this is my display this year here at Philly Brickfest. So it's, it's every Lego pirate ship and most of the big pirate sets from the last uh, however many years it's been, 26 or so. Um, so the ships obviously are the main, the main piece. So we've got the first one here, the Barracuda, the original, or Dark Shark, depending on which side of the pond you hail from. <laughs> There were different different names for for depending on where you were in the world. Yep. Yeah. So it was the Dark Shark over in Europe, and it was the Black Seas Barracuda here, which is what I knew it as as a kid. So this was the one I coveted as a child. Never got it. So now I have three of them. <laughs> I 
know a lot of people have a lot of like fond memories attached attached to that ship there. What what were some are some of your favorite details of this particular ship? Um, so what I really like about this one, and no other pirate ship ever repeated this, with the exception of it kind of, they kind of did in the skulls of it. You can see here, they actually included the holds that you could flip up. And there's nothing in there, and it was a pain in the butt to reach your hand in. <laughs> but just the concept of it I always loved. The, a little more realistic with that type of thing. Okay. Yeah, you know, burst out of it. So, And then that one was paired. So all the pirate ships have always paired. Each wave has paired a good guy ship with a bad guy ship. So obviously, and the bad guys always get the more fun, bigger ship. So this was the Caribbean Clipper, which was the good guy ship from the original wave. My sails are a little beat up, but what can you do? It's 1989. So you guys probably weren't even born then. I, I was not. That was long I'm before I was born. Old now, that's a little terrifying. So. So are some of these kits you had when, when you bought when they were originally out, or have you picked all these up later? I picked all these up later. Okay. Sourced a lot of them, and actually some of them, the sales are really expensive when you source pirate ships. Um, so these two are the original sales, but you can see like on this one, I've actually made my own. Uh, so you can, I, got, I did the design on CAD, and then I printed them on, um, you can get like fabric, printable fabric. Okay, right. And uh, you just print them on that, and so it works really well, and it's a lot cheaper than trying to do it with the... Uh, with sourcing it. So then wave two was the original Imperial flagship, which is, as you will see, very lame in comparison to the later one. But, um, and then this was the first one. They introduced these narrower hulls. So the original good guy ship, the Caribbean Clipper, there were all the wide hulls. And it just kind of looked funny to have a short, squatty ship. So this is a little more proportional. Um, and so that's what they did with the, uh, the narrower hull pieces. So, and then the second wave, they introduced this little gimmick of when you turned the wheel, it actually kind of turned the rudder a little oh, bit. Okay. So, and they also had, and this was the, the Skull's Eye, which was the big one of the second wave. And for a long time, this was the undisputed biggest ship. Um, I've modified mine slightly. I added the walkways to make it a proper cannon well. That wasn't on the original ship, uh, but the Barracuda had it. So I was like, ah, why didn't they include that? So, and they kind of did their, their attempt at the hull there in the front, which I'm going to have trouble with my big adult hands getting in there, but it pops up and you can get in the front there. So working anchor, that was a new improvement on this one and obviously bigger. It's technically the same number of middle hull pieces, which is how pirate ship lengths are always measured, uh, but they kind of stuck it out a little farther on the front and stuck it out a little farther on the back. So, but, and then, then that year they also introduced something different, which was um, they made a small pirate ship that year. Uh, the Renegade Runner. So this was like $30 when it came out, which is probably like $50 in today's with inflation. But uh, but this is a cheaper way for kids to get in and have uh, at least some of the pirate ship experience. Because pirates isn't as much fun if you don't have a ship. <laughs> That's very true. You lose a lot of the you playability. Really you really do. <laughs> then the third wave, so basically the second wave was bigger is better. And the third wave was we can't go any bigger, so we'll try gimmicks. And it really just didn't work. So there's the gimmick which I've just never understood. So these ones included this thing where you pull the pin and the mast collapses. It's Lego. If I want to break the mast, I'll take it <laughs> apart. I don't need this goofy gimmick that is so annoying because when you go to pick it up, it always flips the other way. So, um, but I won't lie, the ability, they also did this where if you pulled the pins on the back, it would break like that. And that was, I guess, kind of cool, but, but it um, meant that you couldn't have an interior cabin Okay. which was a real bummer. So it's just kind of open there and it looks stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they just took all the shortcuts, right? There's no wheels on the cannons. The colors are gaudy and uh, it just wasn't very I good. Mean, this is sort of a good example of like playability at the expense of like a decent design. Yeah, exactly. And that, that went to new heights with the good guy ship of that year, which was the uh, Armada flagship. So they, they forewent the standard blue coat, red coat, and kind of did a Spanish Armada thing. And this is just too many colors in one Lego set. Like, it's just too many colors. And it just wasn't a very good set at all. And then- I do love the minifigs though, though. The mini that minifig cool. is very yeah, cool. the minifigs are cool. Yeah, but it was, not, I, I get the idea of trying to do something a little different, but it just was poorly. And then the absolute abysmal, most hated, I don't even know that you can call this a pirate ship, but they had introduced the little one, and it's just so bad. In every way, it's just so bad. Like the col yeah, we, yeah, the colors, everything is terrible. So Pirates was discontinued for like 15 years after that because it was just so terrible. So the reboot, I believe it was 2009, and they came out with this. And uh, this is pretty good. So this is the Brickbeard's Bounty, 
and uh, you can clearly see that it's reminiscent of the Barracuda, which was smart of them to go back and uh, base it off of that. So this one's okay. The biggest problem with this one is they use these this, the little stick hose pieces for the mass, and it just, especially after the heft of the old ones, that just just doesn't look right. It looks too twiggy. I think that's the same thing they did as the Vikings ship yeah, sail as yeah, well. Exactly. That was kind of that era. Vikings, yep. Okay. Yeah, so this one was a few years after the Vikings. But then, then Lego came out with a glorious <laughs> gift to us pirate fans. The biggest and the best ever. This one came out of nowhere, and it was, it was kind of the, um, I forget what they called it, but an advanced builder series or whatever it was back in 2010. And uh, so this is also the only one to ever include a truly proper hold. Uh, down in there and obviously it's got an extra middle middle piece so this is actually four middle pieces long and uh, this is just magnificent in every way it really is you compare that to some of these other yeah. ships we've looked at and it just doesn't even <laughs> take this next to it it's just like that's that's just funny right there that's just funny like yeah so, looks like the little you know yeah so let's see how old is this one now I want to say 2010. That sounds about right. That sounds right because I, I remember because this was my I was studying for my PE exam when this came out. And I said if I pass the PE exam, I'm gonna buy myself that pirate ship. <laughs> and I passed the PE exam, so I got the pirate ship. No, that is a, a beautiful ship. It yeah, is. it is magnificent. So, uh, and then they they went and went uh, with Pirates of the Caribbean. So these are gonna look a little different. I heavily modified this one because I hated how they did the back. I didn't think it was movie accurate. So this is a Black Pearl, and um, modified. But, uh, but yeah, pretty decent. It was only 100 bucks when it came out. And to get a ship this size for 100 bucks back in whenever this was, 11 or 12, um, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. So based on the, I don't have the minifigures with it. I'm not sure where they went. But. And then it was paired with uh, the Queen Anne's Revenge, which is one of the most striking ships ever built by LEGO just because of the color palette. Um, and just the cool back and everything with all the, the sticker detail. And it's just, it's really... It's, the bones and skulls. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it just screams pirate ship. But, uh, but yeah, and then the sails. The dark red sails are just a great color for the sails. So. And then it was discontinued again for a few years. And no new Pirates of the Caribbean movies came out. And let's face it, the last few ones haven't been very good anyway. And uh, LEGO tried one more time to reboot Pirates. The problem with it was they didn't release a good guy ship. It was the one time they didn't release a good guy ship. Anchor is caught on the other sail. <laughs> <laughs> nice. There you go. So, so again, obviously modeled after the, the previous non-licensed pirate ship. So this was the Brick Bounty. And uh, it's just a little juniorized. Like, it's yeah, not it terrible. It really has that look to yeah. it. And it was interesting because I've, I've looked into it some. And... Um, I haven't heard it directly from Lego, but pirates, like when I was a kid in the 80s, we played pirates, that's what we did. And now a lot of the um, kids today, like pirates have become really juniorized, with like Jake and the Neverland pirates and stuff, they're seen as more of a little kid thing, okay. as opposed, you know, and superheroes and all that stuff is more the, the older kid thing. So that's probably part of it, but it's, it's heavily juniorized and it only lasted one wave and then was gone. And then with the last Pirates of the Caribbean movie, they came out with the ghost ship, which was, um, or Salazar's Revenge is what they called it, or um, the uh, Silent Mary. And this ship is awful. Not because, like, I get what Lego was trying to do, and it is very different. My biggest complaint is there is no good way to pick this up. Like, you pick it up and stuff breaks and falls apart. Like, you gotta kind of reach your fingers underneath and try to get the superstructure and see there, even there. Ugh. So, it's different, I guess. Yeah. And it's a ship, so I had to get it, because at this point I had all the rest, but. I, I don't like this one at all. <laughs> it definitely is a very different design, yeah. It's, it's not something you display, right? Because it's not really that... I mean, it's visually interesting, but it's not something you'd put on your shelf and be like, ooh, look at my cool ship. And for a child to try to play with this would just be awful. Like, it would be awful. So, some clever building techniques and stuff, but what can you do? No. Well, very neat. So, out, out of all of those, is there a, a clear favorite here? So, I mean, just by sheer quality, it's got to yeah. be that. But that was the, the Barracuda, the original one, was the one I pined for as a kid. So that one's got the, <laughs> the, the nostalgia, nostalgia factor. Yeah, exactly. Pure nostalgia factor. But.